We're going to rise for the pledge. After that, we invite you, if you so desire, to join us for a moment of silence. Please keep all those that are in our armed forces and those in public safety in your thoughts. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> priority Carroll, Commissioner Weaver. Ah, well, uh, first priority is July 23rd is a walk in the park with Commissioner Weaver at Sandy Mountain at 7 o'clock. I invite the whole public. I don't care if it's in my district or wherever. Uh, come out or we'll discuss all kinds of issues, uh, whatever's on your mind. And uh, I have a whole uh, cast of characters, I think, to talk with at uh, that meeting, and um, there'll be some surprises coming, so. Surprises? Surprises oh, for yeah. the community. Are you giving away snowballs or something? <laughs> on that, I did my uh, walk with the commissioner on Monday at the Crimgold Park in Woodbine. It was a wonderful event. It's a great time for people to come out and talk to their commissioners. It's very informal. And I was fortunate enough to do a tour of the engineering department of the county on Tuesday. We have a wonderful staff in our engineering department educating me on all the different things we do. They're inventorying all of our assets. There's a lot in this county that we don't are not aware of. Pipes on the road, culverts, they're all very important. They're monitoring them. And I'd also like to give a special thanks to the Opioid Prevention Coalition. At their meeting yesterday, Commissioner Frazier and I were there yesterday to thank them for their hard work. The numbers are coming down in opioid overdoses, but we assured them that they need to keep the pressure up because we do not know whether this is an actual trend that will be sustained or not. But we're very grateful for all the hard work that that coalition is doing addressing the opioid epidemic within this county. So thank you, Michelle McVeigh and her staff. A uh, couple quick things. One, uh, an absolute uh, wonderful shout out to uh, our U.S women's soccer team for their World Cup victory. Um, and I, I share that because uh, the um, sports programs in our public schools here in Carroll County really have some amazing athletes. And I know down, especially in the South uh, Carroll part, there's a lot of uh, girls soccer that have uh, achieved great results and have moved on to women's soccer, both in uh, universities and international play. Um, so just Watching the women play uh, was pretty impressive, and congratulations on their fourth win. Uh, as far as priorities um, for Carroll County, I think the comprehensive uh, rezoning process that we're working ourselves through, we have a session this afternoon, is a priority uh, for us and for the community. So continue to uh, uh, share with us um, your insight you know, on the zoning process as we're working through uh, the comprehensive rezoning and look forward to getting a, a strong, comprehensive, uh, holistic uh, effort completed and put into place. So those are a couple things. Thanks. Just like to say that uh, Tuesday I had uh, a walk at uh, Freedom Park um, for with the partnership for Healthier Carroll County. Pretty well attended. Um, there's a trail there. I've only been to Freedom Park one time, one other time. I have to admit that. To watch a rugby uh, game, but um, it was a nice, it was a nice trail. It's almost two miles long. We walked the trail. It was it was a good walk? There were some <laughs> people said, "Don't walk too fast." I said, "Don't worry about that part. <laughs> we'll be fine." It was kind of a warm evening, but everything worked out very well. I'm going to have my walk with the commissioner on July 16th, seven o'clock, at Westminster Community Park. Time to come out, uh, ask questions, walk and talk kind of thing. I think we'll make some laps around the, the community uh, park. Just, you know, because one lap around wouldn't, wouldn't be enough. I know people want to get out there and walk for a while. So I would like to, I envision walking for 30, 30 minutes, 45, something of that sort. And if anybody wants to stay afterwards and talk and ask the questions and so forth, that'd be great. Again, that's the 16th at 7 o'clock. <clears throat> also, piggyback on what Commissioner uh, Boucher said about the Opioid Prevention Coalition, that meeting, these people, <clears throat> those people are doing a lot for Carroll County. We are way ahead of other counties in what we do that prevent drugs and drug use in this county. We really do. It's amazing. <clears throat> and 
what I found out, which was very interesting, we were talking about things, and right behind one of the speakers is like a big whiteboard with all the stuff. You can go right to the county website, uh, the health department website, and you can find all the stuff that we do if you have a question about this. And people, which was brought up here, think that the health department is only for like shots and, and, and physical health and so forth, but it's also for mental health uh, problems as well as, as uh, addiction to drugs and so forth. Call them up. They have the no wrong door policy, which is a great policy, which means if you call them and you get the wrong person, that person will still talk to you, put you on hold, and put you to the right person. So you have a connection, you have a warm hand off to the person you actually need to talk to. So don't be afraid to call them, let them know what the problem is, they will help you out. And that's about all I have, thank you. Okay, a couple quick things for me. Uh, Commissioner Rothstein and I attended the uh, legislative committee meeting, the first one, um, time flies. January will be here before you know it, when all those uh, fine folks will be back in Annapolis. Us fine folks were there yesterday <laughs> getting ready for that. Uh, I'll bring more of that, which I think all of you need to hear uh, up in, in open admin when we get done with our agenda. Uh, we had an incident in the county yesterday, uh, and I want to give a shout out to our uh, first responders and uh, all of those, um, EMS uh, and uh, law enforcement. Um, that was um, a challenging scene. Uh, I listened to the incident as it went down, and um, as always, we are very lucky to have the folks that we have in place here to take care of those things. So a shout out to all that were involved with that. Uh, and on that same theme, uh, if you get a chance, scoot down to Winfield. I, like, I know you like scoot. Uh, <laughs> scoot down to Winfield this week, Carnival, good fried chicken, and then next week is Reese. And uh, if you can find a place to park at Reese, go down there. Don't park on 140. <laughs> Uh, that's a shout out as to the amount of people that go to that carnival. That's a great, yeah, that's a great event. Thanks so, for plugging Winfield. So Winfield and Reese are going on, and then uh, Mount Airy's to come, and Hampstead, and then it'll be fall, and we'll be picking pumpkins, <laughs> and you'll fall be picking fest. something else. I don't fall know what fest. You pick. Anyway, so. so all right, so, and I'll bring up uh, what happened at Mako yesterday in Open Admin. All right, uh, first on our agenda this morning is uh, transportation development plan presentation. Everybody's looking at one another as to who's coming up. So it looks like Stacy gets the nod. Someone's got to do and I'll let you, I'll let you tell <laughs> who else is in the room, Stacy, and who you, you know. Well, you can do the introductions. Everyone that's in the room, or just who's up with me? Well, with you and the ones that are hiding, because you know it's the ones that are hiding. Yeah. Okay. Let me get you some copies here. So since the last time I did a presentation, you had no idea what I was talking about. Prepared. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Oh, no, it's, it's all good. Sorry. And there's your sign. That's right. <laughs> Thank so you, Stacey. Yes. <laughs> all right, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I am here with Liv Rood. She is with KFH, our vendor developing our transportation development plan. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning in the back corner hiding is our director, Jeff Castingway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are here this morning to update you on the process and discuss our transportation development plan or TDP. The TDP is a five year plan. It includes any updates or changes um, that we want to make in our transit service over the next five years that may or may not happen. Just to put them in the plan, this is a plan that we refer to when we say if it's not in the TDP, it doesn't happen. Um, we wanted to come to you at this stage in the process and get your input on the direction of the recommendations from KFH as you will be approving our final document in the coming months. Lib is going to go into some detail regarding what goes into the TDP, um, where we got, where she got their recommendations from, from the community input, and then their recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Good, Good morning. Um Again, I'm with the KFH group, and we are under contract to MTA to work on uh, transit development plans for locally operated uh, transit systems in Maryland, Carroll County's being one of them. 
So just a little background about what a TDP is. Um, some of you, I'm not, I don't have a history here. I don't know how many of you have been on the commission for a long time. But they are required um, in Maryland for all transit programs. Um, it really just serves as a guide for a five-year period so people know, um, so the MTA and the local community knows what to expect from the transit program over that period. And then it allows for planning, um, you know, if you think about what you might need over that period, you put it in the plan and there's a chance that it will get funded. So elements of the plan include identifying need in the community, um, analyzing the performance of the current system to see what routes are doing well, what routes aren't doing so well, and see maybe some fixes for them for the ones that aren't doing great, analyzing the organizational structure, and then recommending the five-year plan and the accompanying budget. And again, it is, it is a requirement of the MTA. And also, um, we're working with the county's locally, adopt, locally appointed um, transit advisory council through the process. So we're attending their regular, our, we've worked our schedule into their schedule in terms of getting the plan accomplished. And we just met with them this week. Um, and that was one of their recommendations was to come and visit you during the process as opposed to waiting till the end when we say, here's the plan, please endorse it. So we thought we'd stop midway and say, this is where we are, this is what we found so far. You know, what do you think? Are we headed in the right direction? So in terms of the TDT, T, TDP tasks. Um, the first task is really just initiating the project in ongoing management, so we're clearly still working on that one. Um, we have completed the first um, three, actually four, the first four technical memorandum for the project. So the first three were really laying the groundwork. It's the, the background of transit in Carroll County. It was the, um, you know, this is, it was input from the Transit Advisory Council in terms of what they thought is needed for the next five years. It was a review of the existing services in terms of trend data and performance data on the trailblazer routes and on the demand response service. Um, and it was also um, in the issues and opportunities, that was the largest of the three technical, of the four technical memoranda. That really documented the need for transit in Carroll County. We did um, one, two, three, three surveys, and, and we also collected demographics on the county. And so some of those findings led to our um, preliminary recommendations that are still under development, which we'll talk about in a minute. So that led us to, um, to number four, which we presented this week to the Transit Advisory Council. And those are the, the alternatives to consider for inclusion in the plan. And also they're, they're still a work in progress, but we want to share the general concepts with you today. Um, so after this point, um, we'll get feedback from you guys and we'll get feedback from the um, council and work a little closer on refining the, the alternatives and then we'll develop the draft and final versions of the plan and then, we'll, then it will come back before you uh, for adoption. So um, in terms of uh, what we heard, what was needed in Carroll County, the first set of, um, of need, this is, that's a pretty long list, this is the stakeholder input. And this, when we, when we, what we call stakeholders is the, the Transit Advisory Council. They work directly with people who need transportation in Carroll County. And we also reached out to some others, such as Carroll Community College, who may, um, who have, who also have needs. They may not be on the council, but they also know a lot about what people need in terms of transportation in Carroll County. So this is what they told us. Um, they said there's a need for out-of-county service. They said there's a need for longer hours of service, both um, earlier and later in the day, and that's primarily for work purposes and educational opportunities. There's a need for Saturday service. More frequent service is needed for the Trailblazer. It takes a long time to get around when you use the Trailblazers currently. There are additional areas that should be considered for Trailblazer um, service, um, such as the, the MBA. The concept of workforce shuttles should be explored. Um, there was a thought that the demand response service is cost prohibitive for some users and agencies. It's, it's quite a bit more expensive than the Trailblazers for the users. Um, the travel time is too long on the Trailblazers. Additional capacity is needed for the demand response program. There will be additional demand in the future as developmental, as the whole developmental disability world is changing to more community employment as opposed to them coming to one place to work each day. They'll be going into the community, which would it's going to be a big strain on their transportation um, programs to try to get, instead of many to one, it's going to be many to many in terms of where they're going to need to go. More college passes are desired as well as a revised timeline for purchase. Real-time transit information will be useful when you, that would be where you get information about when exactly the bus is coming as opposed to when it's scheduled to be coming. And additional marketing of the service is needed. 
the next piece of input we got was from the riders themselves. We did they, it. Yes. Back to those. Were they in any particular order, or were they Th random? Those are not in order. No, not Good. in order. Okay. Yeah. This is us. this is what people said, and we okay say. A couple yeah. of folks in the room know why I'm asking that question. So. I know. <laughs> I, I heard. I heard. I know. Okay. So, I'm just putting it out there. Is what people said. So who, okay. are the, who are the stakeholders? So you said two so far. Okay. The the transit advisory council is okay. made up of several community members who've been appointed by this group. I believe, who have direct knowledge of um, of transit needs in Carroll County. And people on that committee are um, human service agency representatives, um, health department representative, um, other community leaders who, who most of people who work with people who need. But service. then, in addition to them, you said the college. Um, yes, and then we called a few. We either emailed or reached out directly to additional. We talked to McDaniel and we talked to the Carroll Community College. I had a nice. Uh, a nice talk with the uh, person from Carroll Community College about things that are needed uh, transportation wise and what they do and don't like about the current system so um, so the community college McDaniel who else um, we also reached out to municipalities I didn't get a lot of response from them I got something from uh, New Windsor but I didn't get a lot of feedback from but I did reach out to municipalities and, and it's still ongoing you know we're not done yet um, also the um, the ARC of, of Carroll County and change we spoke directly with them. We spoke directly with the health department. Um, and the senior center. Right, and the senior center. We spoke directly with the Business senior services, center. yes. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for someone to bring up on their phone to show exactly where the bus is at and no. it's, where it's not? Right. No, no, that's that something. Their, yeah, we're getting that. That'll be oh, one okay. of our recommend recommendations. Yeah, when yeah. we get there. Um, Sorry for getting ahead. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's the. the where all those ideas came from, what people told us, um, who we called stakeholders. Um, obviously, very important additional group of stakeholders are current riders, and so we surveyed them directly. Uh, we got 122 uh, riders to complete a survey for us uh, while they were on the bus. Um, what we found was that the survey, um, the, the people who ride the bus ride frequently. Um, over 77% of the riders use the service at least three to four days a week. Um, they're using it to go to medical appointments, to work for social and recreational uh, opportunities, and also uh, to go to school. And I think we asked them, you know, if you didn't have Carroll Transit, how would you get around? And 35% um, of them said they wouldn't make the trip. So that really shows the importance of the service to the people who use it, is that they wouldn't be able to get where they're going. You know, 35%. Others would get family, friends, or some, some other means like that. The riders had the highest level of satisfaction with the drivers. And then in terms of things that the current riders would like to see, um, the number, this is, this is in order. Uh, the, the number one thing they said was service later in the evening, 46, uh, excuse me, 49.6% of the riders indicated that. Additional Saturday service and service on Sundays. So those are the current riders' top three requested <coughs> improvements. Um, we also did a public survey, um, and this is kind of interesting. We do this via SurveyMonkey, and then we had paper, paper backup copies at the libraries. Um, just for people who did not have internet service. And we also got some dribbled in via the mail. I don't know if I told you that, but that was fun. We got some, we put our address on it too, so we got some via mail. So people, uh, 436 people took the opportunity to complete that survey, which I thought was was really a pretty good number, yeah, considering um, we sent a press, re well, we developed it, but you guys sent out a press release saying, hey, it's available, here's the link, please take it. So, um, so this is what we heard. For people who don't use transit, the service improvements that would impact their choice to use transit would be um, better availability of the service closer to where they're going, closer to their home and closer to their destination, 45% said that. Um, more frequent service, 27.5% said that. Service outside the county limits, 27% said that. And some people, um, we, did it, we always ask this question because sometimes you ask all these questions and you really, some people are just not going to ride. So we said, would you ride? And they, some people said, no, I'd prefer to drive, 36%. So there's some honesty out there, which is, which is nice. We also asked um, if people were aware of Carroll, Carroll Transit Services. And what we found, we asked if they were aware and if they had a positive impression, if they're aware or had a negative impression, or if they weren't aware. And those responses are there. Um, about 38% were aware of the services and had a positive impression of Carroll Transit Services. 24.5% um, were aware and had a negative impression, and 37.7% were not aware of Carroll Transit Services. So you can see there, there's a need for some, some, marketing, um, some marketing work for the system. 
We got a lot of public comments, which are always really interesting to read. Um, we, we provided them in an appendix to the full report. But 222 comments, as a matter of fact. Um, they're a little bit hard to sort through, but uh, when we did sort through them, we found that about 60 of them requested better service and or connections to the Baltimore area. 50 specifically mentioned that no additional tra transit services are needed, particularly to out of county destinations. We had a few of those comments. People moved to Carroll County to get away from the city and they didn't want transit, and that's just, that, that was their opinion. Um, the comment topics were varied. Um, there were specific service ideas and complaints. There were compliments. There were requests for additional services and marketing. And then again, as I mentioned, sentiments that no additional transit services are needed in Carroll County. So we got a full, full spectrum of comments. Um, we also did an employer survey, um, just because this is also a piece, you know, when the stakeholders told us people have trouble getting to work, we thought, well, let's see if we can get some employer input on that, on that, um, that piece of information. Um, so we had 19 participants representing 5,414 <coughs> employees. So that that's a pretty decent, uh, a decent return, I think. Again, for a, a um, an optional kind of survey. Um, and of those participants, 54% um, indicated that they are aware of transportation concerns from their employee, uh, from their employees. That should say employees. Sure. Yeah. It says employers. Um, and some of the concerns um, that they expressed was that they have difficulty arriving to work on time in the morning. Um, there's a lack of Uber availability in the county. There's inconsistent carpooling. Um, and I think what they meant by that was if sometimes there'll be a carpool arranged, and if that carpool driver quits the company or has a problem, then they're out four employees instead of just one. So that car, the kind of the um, the domino effect of losing a carpool member. Um, they mentioned unreliable public transportation, um, and they mentioned the lack of connections for out-of-county employees, specifically from the Owings Mills Metro Station. Suggestions and comments from the employers were um, expanded public transportation, greater, abil greater availability of Uber and Lyft, um, and they mentioned that reliable transportation options will help attract more workers and make the hiring process less cumbersome. So we took all this information um, together with some of the data that we collected on the demographics and the um, analysis of the services that are currently operating, and we developed some um, alternatives to discuss with the, with the Transit Advisory Council. So this is just, this is fresh. This is just this week. So these are still under development. So I just want to run down the general concepts, and we're still working out the particulars and, and still working out whether these would be go forward in the five-year plan. So this, these are the things that we really want to you to think about in terms of your um, your opinions since you will be adopting the final plan. Um, the first um, part were all trailblazer route adjustments, um, and this was really to improve the travel time, the route productivity, and respond to customer requests. These are tweaking those trailblazer deviated fixed routes to make them work better, and those were pretty much a cost neutral um, endeavor on that one. The next one um, involves extending the hours and days of service on the trailblazers, again, in response to what the riders told us. Um, service early in the morning, later in the afternoon, and closing the midday gap. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the schedule, but there's a lunch break. Um, most transit programs, as they, as they grow up, they, they figure out how to cover that lunch break through relief drivers and that kind of thing. It's pretty common in a, in a young system to have things like that. But then as the system matures, they figure out how to close that. And people really do want that because that's when they're trying to come home from appointments and, and there's an hour when there's no service. Um, additional Saturday service and then Sunday service. So those were the focus of the second alternative. And this, is, this does involve additional funding because it's additional hours of service. Um, we also put an alternative there for limited out of county service. I know there's been some political discussions about it anyway it hasn't been politically popular in the past but that's people had mentioned they wanted it so we thought well we'll put it on the list and see where see what happens to it so there's that alternative um, there's also the alternative to make some serve some changes to the demand response um, program and this is really to free up some some of those hours that are spent um, on the door-to-door -door service and translate that back into the tran into the trailblazer service and this concept would be qualifying riders um, based on their disability status. So if you, if you live within three quarter mile of a trailblazer route and you are able to get to the stop, then they would ask that you do so instead of using the more expensive and time consuming demand response. And then if you really need the service, if you can't get to the stop, then they would continue to be able to use the demand response. 
The next uh, category would be mobility management and marketing. And this concept is to hire a mobility manager that would really develop um, a database of all the available resources in Carroll County for public transportation, public and human service transportation and volunteerism. And this, um, this program is interesting because it, it, the grant to fund it is 80-20. So it's 80% covered by federal and state grants and just a 20% local match. So this is, you know, it's a good way to get a mobility manager on board for not a lot of money um, if it's something that the commission wants to do. Um, we also uh, put in there an information station at, at the Burke Center where the Trailblazers um, currently meet um, so that people could get a little more information about the system um, with a staff member there or a volunteer that's still on the table. Um, the other alternative that was discussed is a ride-sharing application. Um, basically, this is a publicly supported Uber-style service for trips that are not cost-effective for the public system to, um, to do. Um, LifeBridge Health is currently doing a pilot program now, so we'd, we'd model it after something like what they're doing. This is where the public system would work with an Uber or a Lyft you know, with a tech company to work out the details whereby um, trips or actual vehicle time could be purchased publicly for these trips. And again, we're still working on this one, but that's another alternative. Um, the last uh, few alternatives, um, infrastructure improvements. Um, there aren't many uh, shelters. Are there very None. None. There's none. none. <laughs> Bus shelters. Uh, bus stops and bus shelters are something um, that we need to work on for the Trailblazers. Again, as the program matures and, and, and there's more def definition of, yes, this is a good stop and this is where, sh where it should be, Let, let's put a shelter here. Um, the concept of a transit hub, uh, right now uh, the Trailblazers use the Burke Center, but is that the best place? Should there be a different place? Should it be purpose built? Should it have a park and ride with it? So these are things to start thinking about. And probably for the five year plan, it's probably more like, let's do a planning study to see if it's needed as opposed to let's build it. Um, so that's in there. Um, technology improvements, um, the idea of a smartphone application to, uh, to pay, and this could also be used for, this would also help the system in terms of its con contractual uh, work that it does because this could all be automated. Uh, instead of giving out tickets, it could all be on a mobile application, which would save a lot and also would save a lot on the record keeping in. So, um, so we're working on this. Um, we're, we have some preliminary, um, at first we thought it, we needed to have electronic fare boxes with this, but in diving a little more into the research just in the last couple of days, um, it's, you can probably do it with tablets. So this, this might not be as expensive as we originally priced it out as. And then the idea of real-time transit information um, where, you, where you could from your smartphone or from your computer see the exact time that the bus is coming as it, as it arrives. Um, and then the last thing we're working on is a, is a little um, comparison of in-house versus contracted services because the county does do so much work already on behalf of the transit program it, and they think it'd be worth taking a look at, well, what would it cost? How would it look if we did everything ourselves? So we're working on that. In fact, we're, we're going to talk to some budget people after this meeting today to, we have some assumptions that weren't ready for prime time yet, so we want to run it by your budget folks. Um, so that's where we are. Um, really, the next steps is to refine that list, um, get the price tags a little more uh, accurate. Right now we have ranges. We're not quite sure about some of the things. So we'll refine the alternatives um, based on your input and the Transportation Advisory Council's input and the, um, and the DPW staff input. If some of these are definitely off the table, we just, we'll just toss them aside and we won't go in the plan. And other things will get you know, solidify the information and the cost estimates. Um, and then we'll prepare a draft TDP for review and comment, and then we'll bring it back to you and ask for your blessing. And we're available for questions. <laughs> with all that information. So, with all that, so, what do you all that stuff. Okay. <laughs> what do you got? So uh, the, the obvious question that comes to my mind is how much attention does the M, does MDOT and MTA uh, pay attention to with these survey results and I ask that question because we battle with them every year for more buses more buses would solve some of these more money would solve a lot of these so how much attention do they pay to I, these I, surveys I think that they pay attention but I also think that they their hands are tied by by the this by the legislative process in terms of how much money is available at the federal level and at the state level. So, you know, they, they can't give you money they don't have. 
So I, that, that's, that's, I think that's the answer. I mean, they, they receive X amount of dollars. Well, of course, there's a federal allocation mm -hmm. for the urbanized area. So the urbanized area of Westminster gets X amount of dollars right. that comes here. And then for the rural side, they divide, the, the MTA is in charge of dividing that up among all the programs in the state. So the federal funding has been relatively level. Right. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you know, there can only be so much they can do with that. And then how much the, the state supports transit is the next question. And that's more of a legislative question than an MTA staff question. Okay. So it's really it's just a it's a function of money, but yeah. I do know they won't give you anything if you don't have your oh well, you know, yeah that, I would yeah I wouldn't even yeah. entertain that <laughs> yeah but it's interesting because uh, how many of the jurisdictions are doing these surveys are they all doing it at the same time or are no they, they're all on cycles yeah okay. the TDP cycles are the, the the state does about three a year three okay. maybe, three TDPs a year about so they're on on a little bit different cycles and you know honestly I could probably give you these results um, without even doing the survey because well, almost every every right. Time I do them, they want. It's pretty they much want, the same. Right? Yeah, you know, once you get tr once you get a base level of transit um, established, then people just want a little bit more of what they have. So they want to go at night. Right. They want to go on Saturdays. They want to go on Sundays. So that's usually what happens. You know, once you have your base system established. Well, it's interesting because apparently this has gotten the attention of the folks at Mako uh, because we. Oh, interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the initiatives that we are entertaining, perhaps, of putting in this year. Is getting more federal funds uh, is this for, for the transportation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And we've identified it drain. really in the in the realm of those that can't uh, do their own transportation. So those that have to rely on, right. not that it's an option, right. but those that rely on on public transportation because they have no other means. Right. And that would typically be those that that have some sort of a medical issue or or you know the seniors that 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 can't or are not mobile. So that's sort of the, the, the stream that we're trying to go down to perhaps get more federal funding. Yeah, that's a big um, drain on every transit program in Maryland. The, the number of paratransit trips that are devoted to dialysis mm -hmm. is incredible. Yeah. And, and those dialysis centers do not pay anything. Well, no guarantees, but that's, that's on the list. But I, but That'd be I, helpful. I, 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 get, yeah. I get exhausted, and I know uh, two of my colleagues, we, we've been down this route for the last four and a half years. Every year, we tell the folks, we've got buses with over 200,000 miles on them, some 300,000. We need a bus, or two, or three. And every year, the same answer is, we'll get to you when we can. So a lot of the survey results, are, again, are driven by the fact that if we had some additional resources, we could. Right. So. Yeah, I completely agree. Enough of my soapbox. We had a backlog of about 16 buses at one time. We did. Was, I think we've gotten down a little bit from that. But yes. it's, I mean, we even that got to the point one time, Lib, where we bought our own. Right. Yeah. Some counties end up doing that. Yeah. Now, about a year ago, we had a trial area at Westminster to additional uh, hours and additional yes. routes. And it was a, like six-month trial on that. And it... Is that taken into consideration any of this? Because it really didn't. Uh, it didn't do well. Didn't right. do well. Right. It wasn't worth. Uh, we talked about um, that, and we think it didn't do as well because it was a very limited area. Um, I wasn't here when we did that trial, but from what I've heard about it, um, it was a very small area of people. It didn't include um, the college. So it couldn't get those college kids or just people taking college classes home later in the evening, and it was very limited in time. So the times that they picked were not best for getting people home from work, and it was the middle of winter. The extended hours that they're looking at here are more for the workforce. So you, which I think it goes, the, if I'm not mistaken, 6 in the morning mm -hmm. until 6 or 6.30. Yeah, it wasn't extravagant. It was right. really, yeah. Just extend. So that if you took the, a, a bus to work in the morning, you would have a bus to bring you home when work was done. The way the pilot program was set up wasn't exactly like that. Right. And it wasn't that you could go, if you lived in Tonytown, you couldn't get into Westminster and get back. It just didn't work like that. But I do believe from, from being on the, the commissioner on this board here, that the extended hours are something that would really help get ridership up because people are talking about, you know, if, if I could get to work, every day at, on time and get then they have a bus to take me home i'd be more likely not not to do well but more likely to use the bus system 
but you have to have a dependable system so that when you get there and you, and you can get home with it. Right now, we don't have that because yeah. when it ends right now, they, five, so well, five the problem, I think, yeah. yeah, yeah and so I think it ends at five o'clock. If you get off at work at five, how do you get home? Right. And also consistency because <laughs> they they do all um, end at slightly different. Like one ends at four or something. Right. One ends at five. You know, just have them consistently. Let's go all the way to six. Um, we're not even. I mean, when I say later in the evenings, that it, that might be a, a misnomer. It's really just till six right now, um, just because of the expense involved with with adding the hour in the morning and closing the mid it, it does add up when you talk about six vehicles out there so um maybe in the future would be more later than that but right now i think what we have written up is just six to six and this is a five-year i'm sorry I know yeah, but this is a five-year plan mm -hmm. if it's not in there we're not going to get the expanded hours because they're not oh well it wasn't in your plan and i do think it's something that's, it's important for carroll county if we want to expand our transit system i really do just just have enough so you can get to work and get home just makes sense that's what trans systems for mostly if you ask me i agree with that it all comes down to the finances and yeah. the state support and that's why i think it has to be in here buses. so the state will give us some support right. it's so, hard to take on more when our buses are mm -hmm. running right. on hundreds of thousands of miles right. and we're adding more to them without replacements and as you said we purchased what three buses i guess last year on our own just to keep up with uh, what was needed with what we presently have so That's right. That's right. just uh, a couple things one first and foremost appreciate the work you're doing and the analysis Thank that you. you're sharing I think what would help me is understanding more of the demographics sure. of those that are riding um, and those that are you're surveying it's a balance between for me where are we putting the resources to our priorities and what is that five-year vision the infrastructure is very important so highlighting to MDOT the importance of continuing to resource the infrastructure that we have here in the county the, the roads um, is hitting a very specific population a very large population this is hitting a much more smaller population and so I want to make sure that when we have those conversations with state that we are um, you know very clear on where our priorities are in line with the vision here so um, I think that them having the demographics would help uh, I'm not for additional public transportation just to have additional public transportation when that can use those dollars to you know fix roads and apply it to you know priorities that we have in the county um, it's not clear to me what the vision is of this five-year plan and if it's if it's asking us what that vision is you know then I, I think there needs to be a, a recommendation Look, in five years this is what we want to achieve uh, and it's not just more buses it's getting you know 17 percent those that could use the public transportation I'm making up numbers to places of work and you know uh, to and from you know the services that they need that they would not have otherwise um, but it's just sure. not clear to me what these numbers really reflect and where these folks reside in the community uh, so if I have that whether it's a heat map or something it would then allow me to say okay let's start focusing in these areas especially if it's Westminster centric you know how do we work then with Westminster in applying resources you know sure. but is it we had, that's all in yeah. the full report I, okay yeah. no I appreciate it and, and you can only share so much on yeah. slides I, I get it but those are the type of things that I'm looking at is the demographics what are the, the needs what is the the vision you know for this five-year plan uh, to help us determine the appropriate resources to put towards these type of priorities so okay, okay. thank you absolutely I like the fact that Commissioner Rothstein brought up the demographics issue I was recently informed by citizen services that by the year 2030 we will have over 58,000 senior citizens in Carroll County how much impact or involvement has citizen services had in this program developing it and are those demographics taken in consideration because I'm sure that as our population grows in age it's all put a greater demand on these services have they been involved in this process and if so to what extent 
Yeah, I did a uh, telephone interview with the uh, citizen services representative who represents the, the seniors. Good. Because that, that's extremely critical on this issue. Absolutely. Yeah, we, d we did recognize that fact in our demographic section that the, the future is old, older looking. <laughs> We're <laughs> Just <epic>. like us. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah. like to thank you for recognizing the need for integrating technology. I know a lot of parents out there track their teenagers as they oh, drive. So there's no reason why people at a bus stop cannot, should not be able to track where the bus is at coming to get them. So bringing this system up to the 21st century would be very much yeah, appreciated. We had a funny discussion at the tech meeting the other day about, well, can't we just, can't we just be friends with the bus? What was the, <laughs> some kind of app where you're friends and you can see exactly can where they them. are and you can track them. <laughs> just be friends with the bus. And, and thanks for your Facebook. work on this. This is very important. That's a lot for us to consider. Like you mentioned, there's a political yeah, a component lot, yeah. to this that affects all of us. And we have a lot to consider. So bringing this in front of us is very helpful. Yeah, and we're not, this is, we're, this is the preliminary alternative. So we still need to, you know, whittle these down and and again your feedback is really is really important so, so what go ahead what's the timeline here that's um what did we talk about we wanted to get a plan done by we the wanted end to of have the, year. the plan done by the end of the year okay yeah all right and then two quick things before i let it go um, one of the things that stood out in my mind was the one, the, the one statistic of 24 and a half percent were aware of the services and had an overall negative impression that's interesting to me. Yeah. I'd like to delve a little deeper into that if we could. And are we going to see all those comments? Or is that in the final report as well? It's in the full report, yeah. Okay. Um, did you make it available? Um, I, I mean, I know that Commissioner Fraser has it because we sent it to the TAC, mm -hmm. but yeah. I can send it to all five of you. All yeah, that seems like a high number to me. Like. I mean, yeah. you know, a quarter of the folks surveyed have an overall negative impression. What? Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, I know we can't get everything covered, but I'd like to know maybe the comments will lead us to why that was the, the factor there. I don't know. So, um, and, the and all of you know, because there were smiles in the room, all of you know about how it's been felt in the past about, you know, out of county services and, you know, bringing people into the county from wherever or, but if it could be more specific, and I've said this before, where you would be taken to, I don't know, say like Johns Hopkins, and I only say that because I have a family member that has asked me before, why can't you take me to John Hopkins? You know, maybe, maybe similar to the way in which we do our veterans shuttle, mm -hmm. you know, have specific, this is who we're taking and this is who we're bringing back. Right. Not, you know, hey, we're going to Carroll, anybody want to ride? Yeah, no, the, the concept so, was really commuter oriented um, because we looked at the numbers and there, I think there were close to 15,000 people who live in Carroll County and work in Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. And there's 6,000 some odd that live in Carroll County and work in Baltimore City. Right. And so if even just 1% of those people decided that they would like to take a bus, that would be 175 people a day. Yeah, you're right. And so, you know, there's, there's people who would like mm -hmm. that option and those would be commuter oriented. So they'd come yeah. back, they'd come back empty or we propose, if it's locally operated, could perhaps come back via Finksburg and right. provide people from Finksburg back to Westminster. So, well, unless yeah, it definitely was the orientation was. was yeah, unless really something's changed, I, I don't care who you are. We love our cars. No, that's true. <laughs> I think Carroll County loves its cars. I think or that's trucks. True. Yeah. Or trucks. Vehicle, I've got a couple vehicles. beach, yeah. so that's right. Yeah. This but, is but, you know, yeah, so it's like hard this. for me to, to, to fathom the fact that, you know, we're, we're going to become so dependent, especially when we're rural like we are. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's just, for me, it's not realistic, but. Well, I would like to comment on that. First is we're only looking at in the morning having three right now, three, three buses seconds. leave at various times from, let's say the Burke center and go through Finksburg or whatever, go and drop off at the Metro station, come back with no one. And then uh, maybe at Finksburg again, pick people mm -hmm. up that might want to go to Westminster. In the evening, it just reverses. So people have reliable transportation to go from one place to the other. I think people are looking for reliable transportation. And the fact that we're going, working with the people that are in Carroll County that would like to have this transportation, I'm thinking, and not have to worry about their cars. And, and you know, if uh, last time I was down to Baltimore, parking's outrageous. Right. I'd rather pay to go on a, a bus to go to Metro, to Metro to come back, and that way I don't have to worry about parking, and I know I can get back and forth. That's all we're looking at right now. We could also, from my understanding, talk to the MTA about providing this service for Carroll County at really no cost to us, but be with one of their buses, and they would do it 
what, what we're asking for and not try to get other things squeeze in with it. Yeah. But we'd have to have those that's talks. Oh, yeah. We'd have to have those talks. That's yeah. part of our work. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm and if it doesn't work out that way, okay, right. it doesn't work out that way. I mean, I but see if we can get it for free, we can get it for free. Yeah, but that goes back to my comment about talking with hey. the leadership over at MDOT, what are our priorities? Right. Yeah. And if that is a priority that we share from to MDOT to MTA, then so be it. But right now, most, I believe, of our priorities to MDOT have to deal with infrastructure. And that's the conversation that well, we It has, we but we have always brought up this system yeah, as well. It's right, always been brought up. Yeah, so we, we, we've always, at, at, at the meeting we have that's coming up in mm -hmm. August uh, the, with the secretary, when they come back, uh, the first yeah. thing he hears is buses, we need buses, <laughs> more buses. Right. Um, so so we've have, always addressed that. Mm -hmm. But we all, you yeah. have two opportunities. Certainly right. at, at Summer May Go and, and then, then at the, at the, the fall. At, at the, the tour. At the tour. The tour that's in one room. Well, so. but I and, and I see that point. It's just it, it it's uh, it's going to be a debate right. when it comes to that because. And actually, we would have to change uh, county policy in order to let that oh, yeah, happen. Absolutely, but yeah. that's down the road as well. But it's, I mean, it sounds like to me we're willing to look at it. Willing to look at anything. Okay. Sure. As long as we're willing, I'm just look. putting it out there. Look. Right. <laughs> <laughs> look, there it is. I'm not willing to look at it. We can't put it in, in, in this report. Okay. All right, anything else for, for uh, Lib or, or uh, Stacy? Okay, thank, thank you. you. I thank think you, you got thank some you. pretty good thank feedback there, so. Thank you. All right, Piney Run Watershed Plan Contract Award. Come on down. Chris is coming down, our watershed restoration engineer. Mike Myers, our Bureau Chief of Purchasing. Anybody else want to jump in on this? Hmm. Doesn't look like it. All right, All right Good morning. Mike, what you got? So the Bureau of Resource Management received a grant to perform a watershed study at uh, Piney Run. So this is 100% grant funded. Um, county went out to bid. We received five proposals uh, to do this study, and after evaluating, we recommend award to AECOM in the amount of four hundred fifty thousand dollars to perform the study. Okay, this is for a study. Yes. Tell us about the study, Chris. What's this mean? Sure. So, if you remember back in January, uh, we talked with you about. Um, the fact that MDE dam safety has required that we analyze the Piney Run Dam. And uh, because it was originally constructed by NRCS, there is an NRCS grant program that will cover uh, analysis, design, and part, uh, portion of the construction of any um, issues that are identified as part of the study. So uh, with your permission, we applied for that grant and received it. And so this is that first step to do that study. Uh, and then from the study, that will identify issues with the capacity of the spillway, um, if the dam needs to be raised, those sorts of issues. Once that study is complete, then we would move on to engineering design and then ultimately construction. What's the grant cover? How much of this? The grant covers the entire amount. The entire amount? Okay. Yes, right. this okay. is fully funded this by the grant. Okay. Yes, there are no county funds right. necessary yeah, I for this. I probably. Uh, this is a good news story. Yeah. Okay. Not used to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then when we get to the engineering part based on the recommendations of the study, mm -hmm. you're going to get more grant money? Yes, there is that. Uh, um, typically, uh, NRCS will fund uh, the planning study, they'll fund the design, and then they will fund a portion of the construction. Okay. So we would need to reapply for the design portion once the analysis is done, but since we're in their program, we feel it's pretty comfortable that they will support moving forward with, with the overall project. The ability to enjoy using other people's money to do this is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is this um, the only priority we have to reach out to NRCS to get other funds for other studies in the county? Or, I mean, the P Piney Run Watershed Study, is, mm -hmm. are there other efforts that we're looking at as well in using this type of dollars? Uh, the funding for it from NRCS is specific mm -hmm. to NRCS constructed dams. Okay. Uh, and this is a it's a this is a large um, this is going to be a long project. Yeah. This will probably take six to eight years before we're all said and done. This study itself, this portion is going to be take us two years to get through. Um, so 
the county doesn't have um, other large dams like this that we would be going to NRCS for funding to assist okay. us with. And honestly, the impetus for doing this was MDE dam safety requiring us to do it. Fantastic. In, in, insert no-brainer here. I don't yeah. know. I'd like to make the motion that the Board of Commissioners award the contract for the Piney Run Watershed Study to AECOM, amount of $450,000. Second. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. That seemed painless. Thank you <laughs> very much. Very good. Thank All you. All right, Thanks. thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Carroll County Stormwater Management Restoration Projects. So Kelly's here, uh, our watershed grants technician, and Gail Angles, our Bureau Chief, Resource good Management. Ladies, good morning. Good good morning. morning. How are you this morning? Doing well. Good. Good. Okay, so we're here this morning to request approval for an award for a grant from uh, the Maryland Bay Restoration Fund, and Kelly's going to explain a little bit about the grant. So 18 months ago, in January of 2018, we, the Bureau of Resource Management submitted an application to the Maryland Water Quality Financing Administration Bay Restoration Fund Wastewater Program for a program of stormwater management retrofits that will address the um, requirements of the county's National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit. And at the end of May, we received word that the county is receiving $2,475,000 to fund 50% um, of the cost of construction for the Greens of Westminster, um, Woodside Estates in Eldersburg, Trevaney Terrace in Tawnytown, and East West Pond in Mount Airy. So we're here today for you to accept the award. That's good news as well. And you have about seven projects, I think, going on now at the present time? We have four projects under construction now, and we have four that we plan on starting up in August and September. So, and then we have to fit these into fiscal year 20. So we're gonna be extremely busy over the next couple of months, yes. Uh, just a question. Do the other counties, are they keeping up with what you're doing here? <laughs> I can't speak for them. I only know that we're we're pulling our hair out at this point in time, but uh, the other thing I did want to mention while we were here, uh, I'd like to give kudos to the staff. Over the past 10 years, we've gotten $17 million worth of grant funding for this program. So I, it goes to say that the efforts that Kelly and staff have put behind these applications is tremendous and has helped in, in, in expenses that have been incurred throughout this process. So I did want to throw that in there just so you guys are aware of that. The cast match that you have here, since most of these are in the municipalities, this is 80-20 with us, correct? So is this cast match of what we have to put up or are we only 80% of this cast match? It's, it's total. It's total what the cash match will be, including, so, but, their, so, including their portions. Okay, so 80% yes. of that basically is us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Is Hey, what's going on? Well, let's do this first. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I don't want to get off one. Go ahead. I'll move that the county commission accept the award of two million four hundred seventy-five thousand from the Maryland Water Quality Financing Administration Bay Restoration Fund uh, Wastewater Program. Wow, what a name! Could second. You, could, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. Got a motion, second. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. One of those projects, the Greer property behind the Ag Center, is that that, is that the, right behind the Ag Center? Or, or is that, is the city doing something there? It's a lot of, yeah, where is it? Is that the city? Yeah. A lot of dirt being moved back there. And I was at the Ag Center board meeting the other night, and they said, what's going on? And I said, um, I, so. <laughs> right, that is the stream restoration project that the city of Westminster is performing. Okay. And it's in conjunction with the use of the gazelle well, it's called because that was the former gazelle property there. Okay. Um, and that is so that they can operate that well at a higher capacity because when they tested that well at one point in time, it had a little problem with inducing some of the stream flow there. So what they're doing is they're going in there and they're relining that whole stream section there and redoing as a stream restoration project in addition to that. Okay. So that ought to be able to allow them to operate the well at a greater capacity at some point in time in the future. Once completed. Very good. I'm going to tell all the Ag Center board members to watch this video. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> 
Can I get a little bit of education to fill me on where we're at with this National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System? Is this so we're in compliance with regulations to bring our existing systems all up to a standard? And if so, where are we at in completing whatever we have to complete? Or is this just continuously ongoing? So this, this is an ongoing permit. Our term ends in December of 19. And we were required to address numerous things in the permit, one of them being what we're doing here today with the impervious area treatment, which equated to 20% of the untreated impervious area in Carroll County, which would be about 1,600 acres of impervious area. So we are right on track with meeting that goal and probably maybe exceeding that goal a little bit uh, when it comes to December 19th deadline. So we're, we're very comfortable with where we're at today. Uh, we do have to complete a couple of projects that we plan on starting in August and September to get to that point, but we're we're very uh, we're we're right on track. Right. And then, that like job. next year, are there new projects that we have to address as well in this system that we're going through, or will we like eventually satisfy the requirements? Right. So the rumor is that we're going to have an additional requirement on the next permit term of 10% in nutrient reductions as well. So we set up our uh, five-year uh, CIP based on what the rumors are saying. So we're planning out projects for that to happen come December, but we don't feel like our permit will be issued until 2020. So annually we'll keep addressing these in different locations? Mm -hmm. the, per the permit terms are five-year permit terms, and we usually try to get address the different locations based on the nutrient reductions associated with uh, the permit that we need to do. So we might work in different watersheds just to make sure we get to that goal of getting what we need in the watershed. And so far it sounds like we're ahead of other counties in doing this, potentially, that we're proactive? We've been very proactive. We've been very fortunate that we've been able to get to this point. But uh, yeah, we, we feel very comfortable with where we're at. I okay. can't really speak for other counties because I don't exactly know what their numbers are. but. I can speak for Carroll County and, and say that we But are. we're not in trouble with state or federal regulators. We're, we're in compliance. Absolutely not. We are okay. in compliance at this point in time. The answer to your question, Commissioner Boucher, is we're always ahead of the other counties. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, you, President. And, You're welcome. And Gail, Anything I, else? I, I shared, really do applaud the 17 million. That is a large number. And um, I shared earlier, I love using other people's money. So continue to do that and uh, really applaud the work that you and the team are doing. Thank get you. us here so thanks thank you Joe. okay thank you playground for the carroll county farm museum manager of the farm museum joanne went maureen from the uh, maureen dunn our senior buyer in purchasing who's that young man you got with you there joanne he's an extra <laughs> I think he needs no introduction. Is that? I don't think he does. No, wait, I've seen this guy hanging around a little bit in the hallways every now and then. So you know. Hi, commissioners. How you doing? Good. This is a fun subject. <laughs> By the way, uh, nice uh, fireworks display. Um, excellent the other night. And I did go out and look at the new playground area and your petting zoo. It's phenomenal what you've done, and Thank a lot you. of it was all donated. I hear so. It's great. I have a good team. We yep, managed to pull it do. off every year, a little bit like this with the weather, but yep. it's come together very nicely. Yep. Yeah, good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Maureen. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, we did go out and solicit proposals for a uh, farm themed playground for the Farm Museum, and we received six proposals. The highest ranked proposal was Cunningham Recreation. And in the amount of $159,997.47, uh, we are asking your concurrence to approve award to Cunningham Recreation. In Queenstown. Yes. Okay. Uh, was there a big difference in the, in, the, in the prices that came in or not? Do you remember, Maureen? Um, what was the I, spread? I don't remember the total okay. figures and I don't think that I have them written down. I was, I was we, just curious. We had told them in the proposal that we only had $160,000. Oh. And they could not right. Well, that makes it that just so happens. <laughs> okay. But the, but the six of them bid based yes. on the information that you gave them. So. Yes. And what they did, like I said, it was a proposal. So a committee ranked them. Okay. And Cunningham, who came up with the highest number. 
Okay. Also, Cunningham had the facilities that we needed. In other words, we wanted a theme that would correspond with the with the farm museum itself, and they came closest to hitting that mark. And uh, you know, just to add to this um, project that we've been going through, we had a lot of people involved in it. Um, it it's going to be something really nice for the young people, for the children. It's going to be ADA uh, accessible. It's going to be on a level. Won't have the the mud and the and the swamp that we were working through before. Yeah, but that's part so, of being on a farm. Um, yeah, but not that bad. <laughs> I don't even have it that bad on my farm. So um, when we get this done, I think it's something we'd be really proud of. Yeah. And, and that uh, site out from the petting zoo is the site for this? Yes, the that's gravel site next right. to the petting zoo. Uh, we yeah. prefer to call it Farm Yard Friends. That's a little more politically correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay yeah. But that is the site for it. And the reason there are such wide sidewalks around the coops is because they are ADA accessible, and that's why there's so much space between them. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, they're pretty nice chicken coops, aren't they? It, We're farm people. We know. It's fantastic what you're so. doing there. So, okay. so I, I applaud the work you're doing. I look forward to you know, seeing the success of this. The concern that I just want to share is providing a number, a price tag, uh, prior to going out to bid. You know, that's how you get that, you know, $3 short of $160,000 if you're saying that's the ceiling uh, mm -hmm. that you have. Um, I'm not used to doing that and seeing bid processes where you're saying here's the ceiling as opposed to just saying here is the requirement and allowing them to then justify the cost. Uh, was there reason that, for that? Or? Correct. Normally we do not provide a price. Right. That's normal. But we have done this before when we know that that's the limit and you just cannot go over it rather than have them submit proposals and then we couldn't accept them because the money was was too right. high right. And, and we've seen other projects done like this where there was less being offered and more being paid right so there's a lot of you can put pressure on different ways. I mean, right. I've done it on the farm, and mm -hmm. you know, you go to a machinery dealer, you mm -hmm. put a cap on things, and they can they can do some pencil work pretty quickly. Right, and that, and that is, and I think it worked. Here. My biggest concern yeah. is, is just that, but uh, I guess the validity of this process, you got six, you know, vendors that came back to you, which is pretty impressive, all within the, that threshold of one hundred sixty thousand. So mm -hmm. that kind of balances out the concern that I would have that somebody would overprice a service or a product because they know that's how much they can get out of it so, so. I think our concern Commissioner was that there is no additional funding in the museum budget for this and we needed to be very clear with them because you know there are projects that come in with add-ons right. um, I can tell you 160,000 right. from the things that the board has looked at is relatively cheap for a playground and for what we're getting yeah. We feel very confident that what we're getting is something that multiple children can use that will meet our other requirements and the farm theme, which is relatively unique. So this is custom-made equipment. So yeah. custom-made playground equipment yeah. for under $160,000 is relatively unheard of. And candidly, simply put, your confidence gives me that confidence, so I appreciate that. Thanks. I feel like it was fair. Yep. I feel like it was fair. I feel like it was a good process. Maureen was very, very helpful to us because it's not something that we normally do. This is a vendor that has worked with Rec and Parks and built the last five playgrounds in the yeah. county, but we also followed the process. It was put out to bid. Okay. So. Do you have a design layout or asset list of what all is going to be entitled in this playground yet? Yes. I mean, that was part of the bid. So it's basically a large climber, um, an additional climber that looks like a tractor. It's something we ask for multiple children to be able to play on it because, like, at the 4th of July, we can get, you know, 50 to 100 kids on the playground. Is that something you could share with us and let us see? It is, but I don't know if any of us have the rendering with us because we actually have gone back to them to fix the colors. I have the list of equipment if you'd like to see the list of equipment. Yeah, that'd be nice because, you know, Commissioner Rothstein brought up a good point about setting out the figure ahead of time and i like to see to it that they, the right they tried to pack as much as possible that for that amount in so we know what we're getting it came out of that third ceiling tile back there <laughs> <laughs> right. it's magic we're actually don't get married to the colors because we're changing the colors 
Thank you, Judy. What they need to be Carol County colors? No, we want them a little brighter. If you know anything about me at the museum, I don't like everything brown. <laughs> I like bright colors. You, you happen to like. I appreciate you producing well, this. Yeah, it gives yeah. us a better no, visual. Visual. No, that's fine. Make a motion. <laughs> And like Ralph said, the reason that they scored so high was because of the theme of the project. It is very much cool. a farm theme. Some of the other projects, cool. some so of the other bids came in, in with things that were a little more generic. And we definitely want something that fits the theme of the museum. I'll tell you, right. in past life of funding, playgrounds, you getting all this for $160,000 is pretty impressive. We, we thought so too. Yeah, that's reassuring, especially after what the point yeah, Commissioner Rawstein brought up, and I appreciate that. Specs. Impressive. I'd like right. to make the motion. Okay. Thrifty group. That the Board of Commissioners award the contract for a playground at the Carroll County Farm Museum to Cunningham Recreation in the amount of $159,997.47. Second. Any other comments, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you very much. Great job. I would Thank assume you. they're like at center in green right now, waiting on our decision. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to they're gonna roll around. now. That now that the light changed, now they're rolling in, right? There you are. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Jack wanted them two weeks ago. So yeah, yeah. We got two hours That's why I said that. <laughs> we need pictures <laughs> of the first kid through mistakes. the project. Do you want this back? Uh, do you want to keep it? If yeah, I don't want to keep it. It's fine. Yeah. If not, I'll take it back. Okay. And thanks for eliminating the manure section. Thank you. <laughs> if the colors are right, I keep it. But. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, County Ordinance Modification 02 06. <coughs> Mr. Singer. As a serious high and tight you got there going there, Mr. Singer. <laughs> He's partial. Thank you. <laughs> Only if he has nicely. Oh, just one. <clears throat> Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Morning. So, um, what we're here to talk to you about today, uh, our procurement folks and, and uh, I and uh, have, have met with Mike and, and his staff to talk about. Um, the health department potentially using county procurement for all, all the purchases that we, we make. We've been since 2002 using county procurement for, for purchases that are over $25,000. Um, there's a state law that allows local health departments to use uh, local purchasing authority, which kind of makes things more simple for us in, in making our purchases. And in our discussion with Mike, and, and uh, actually we had Tim Burke in, involved in the discussion in Roberta, uh, we feel like this will have minimal or no impact on the county staff because our, our procurement staff, uh, Carol's our, our procurement chief at the, at the health department, are going to be uh, maintained at the health department. We're just going to follow your rules instead of following uh, the state's process, which is a lot more complicated and, and, and makes our life a little bit more difficult. So essentially, uh, what I put in front of you, um, there's two things that I'm asking you for today, and the one's relatively simple in housekeeping, and that is... Uh, the course servants age agency no longer exists as it was back in 2002 and is now part of the health department as our overall behavioral health authority so just to clean things up um, I'm suggesting that we scratch that from uh, what's currently in county code because there is no course service agency and it's not applicable so uh, under 3202 32.01 that, that I uh, that I handed you I'm suggesting that we scratch all of that language and then what I'm asking you for in, uh, in the ordinance that allows the health department to use county procurement procedures is to scratch where it says with a value of $25,000 or more and then we can make all of our, our purchases in a, in a similar manner as to what the county does. Mike? So, yes, uh, I, I fully support this. It really has no effect on our workload on the county level. Um, got a great relationship with the health department and Carol and her staff so where we can pro provide assistance we will but it really doesn't have any effect on us so. okay how many items a year do we you purchase over $25,000 well they're quite quite a number I mean obviously at the health department uh, we, we have uh, you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 staff and uh, we have vehicles that, oh, okay. that those staff need to do for inspections and things of that nature but 
those have already been going through the county process. Uh, I mean, there's the, the mobile care collaborative thing we're going to talk about today is, a, is, is, is one of those things where you know, we, we're purchasing an RV, but some of it's with grants funds, some of it's with state funds, some of it's with county funds. It's, we've got a whole mixture. Of, we have, uh, I think, uh, 70, 74 different sources of funding that we deal with over at the health department, so we have a whole bunch of different budgets and things that we're dealing with. But, but the, the county process, the, the state process can, I, I guess, Carol, you can attest to it could take when, when we a lot of times when we get grant money we're facing a turnaround time of you've got a short period of time to implement this grant and the state procurement process just uh, essentially handcuffs us on being able to get things done because it, it can take upwards to six months to a year to buy something and uh, and being able to use the county procurement is, just makes our life so, so much more simple I, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that I, I just um the ability to work with Mike and his staff, and it, it's just really enabled us to purchase things in a timely manner, get our staff what they need so they can continue to serve citizens mm -hmm. of the county. And it, it's just been a, a great working relationship, and Mike's guidance, Maureen's, it's just been, and Tina, starting to work with Tina on things, then it's been great. There's really no additional workload on the county. They're just gonna use our policies and procedures and hopefully streamline and make things more efficient for the health department. I know working with Mike is great. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Spencer, yes, I correct. think there's a typo just to make just to oh, clarify I, things. In the first section that you're asking them to change about the reference the core services, you have thirty two oh one in the red that's scratched out. Yes. And then it's thirty two oh two in the blue. Yeah, so, so the 32, 32 I pulled this all up off the county's website in the, in the legal references, and 3201 and 32, it's, this is how it's listed when you print it. 3201 is the core service agency authority to use county procurement, and then it lists 3202. So I guess that's kind of like a table of contents when I printed it out. Oh. So 3201 all refers to the, uh, to the core service agency, right. and we, we're just eliminating that because we no longer have a core service agency in Carroll County. And it's all part of the local behavioral health authority and falls under the health department okay. and so what we're asking that we're leaving the 3202 and I, I don't know how we you know, you know the formatting and all will be up to the county attorney right. okay. once we put this out to, uh but I, I was just doing this as a as a visual to show the commissioners what we want to change in the language and i guess ultimately uh tim staff will right so we, you're not you're not replacing that first the second line their 3202 carroll health department authority in 3201 you're just eliminating 3201 3201 is no right. longer necessary and yeah. and the only thing we're changing in 3202 is striking with a value of twenty five thousand dollars or more is what we're asking okay. for just and okay. you know i guess the way that this works and that I, I you know and i haven't been involved in a lot of county ordinances is asking you all to uh allow us to proceed to a public mm -hmm. hearing to amend the ordinances as uh mm -hmm. as we're suggesting here and Tim and his staff would put together exactly what it would look like to uh, to make this work for us. Should that state authority to use Carroll County procure procurement other than just county procurement? What's in the Carroll County? Is this to be part of our code? Yeah, okay. it's in our code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah, just that supersedes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So what, what you okay. see here, everything that's on this paper is what you know. I went out to your website the other day and I clicked on it and I said, okay, procurement ordinance, <laughs> and I printed it out and I said, this is what I want to line through and take out of there. So this is what's presently there. I mean, if we want to, if we want to wordsmith anything, that's that's fine. We just need to uh, to let Tim know what we want it to look like before we take this to uh, to a public hearing. And I'm that essentially asking you all to. Uh, well. Let us move forward. We'll with make the sure that hearing. that's done. But I think you've okay. got the the, the the gist of what we're trying to do here. So, okay. um, I'll make the motion that the Carroll, Carroll County Board of Commissioners proceed to a public hearing to amend the current county procurement ordinance, thereby allowing Carroll, Carroll County Health Department to fully use county procurement and strike the twenty five thousand dollar minimum purchase limit and the references to the core service agency. Second. <coughs> Any other questions on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye unanimous thank you thank you gentlemen thank you. okay thank you all right and now in the continuing theme of health I am now going to ask for a motion uh, that we put our commissioner hats aside and sit as the Board of Health so move is there a second, second. all in favor aye. Aye. aye okay you're all now the Board of Health you feel differently or anything <laughs> <laughs>
I feel healthy. I don't know. Maybe you guys should just stand up and switch seats. or. Yeah, we could do that if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Something could, of that nature. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, my, my first item on, on the uh, list of things that we want to talk to you about today is, is essentially asking that uh, um, that we, we do the uh, minutes for the Board of Health essentially the same as what you do with, uh, with your, your county um, your county business, and that is using the uh, video archive and the process that you presently use, um, rather than doing written minutes. Because I, I just, it, it's, it's not a huge deal to us, but it is. Uh, you know, I, I kind of feel like uh, sometimes I have uh, a clerical person looking at the video of the uh, of the meeting in order to generate written minutes so we can get them over here and signed and, and formally done in that way. And to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense from an efficiency standpoint. And I know. Um, that that the that the meetings are indexed and and uh, you can get to any point in the meeting on any agenda item and all that way and uh, I just think that it makes makes sense in this day and age with technology uh, to discontinue doing uh, written minutes and and uh, do things similar to the way that the county's doing business with the rest of your minutes but uh, it's kind of up to you all to consider okay let's address that one now because that's the only uh, staff recommended motion will have as a result of sitting at the as the Board of Health discussion on this item how often are we talking twice a year a couple times a year well you know honestly it's it's we're required to meet twice a year but we've had a couple of these things pop up recently where where we've had exceptions the master plan and whatnot and I think I looked at the last three years we've been averaging meeting probably about three or four times a year so it's it's not a lot of times a year but uh, you know it's I mean, I, I still may be uh, old-fashioned in the sense that it's easier to see physical minutes and search uh, minutes when I'm Googling topics as opposed to looking for videos. Um, so if it's, like you said, not that big of a deal for you to do and you do have the resources to maintain written minutes, my recommendation is we maintain written minutes. Uh, for those that want to be able to, you know, easily search them. So that's my. How often do you get requests for the minutes? Is that something you track or know? I, I've, as long as I've been at the health department, I'm not aware that anybody's ever requested us to see the, the written minutes. And actually, they're they're kept in a book in my my office. And and uh, I've been at the health department for 31 years. And oh. As far as I know, no one's ever what asked for the written minutes. Well, that's, but that's a good point. Now, how hard is it to go search a video requirement of the minutes? Can, is it sub like is it subcategorized, broke down? Could you isolate and locate spots? It's, in on, it? it's well, on the it's, county website. There well, and a video. It's user friendly. Very. Everything but, is everything is indexed by by subject, topic. just like your agendas are. I, I apologize. Are the minutes public, or are they? You said they're in your book. They are public. We keep written minutes. They they. They're we not haven't ever. We we. I, I guess. You know, we, we could add an extra step to it and post them to our website, but it's never been uh, something, like I said, in, in, as Commissioner Boucher brought up, uh, that uh, in, in the years that I've been at the health department, nobody's ever requested the minutes. It's generally, if we have an action item, somebody wants something yeah. and we, and we, we either you. grant it or disapprove it, and then it, then it's, uh, it moves on from I, there. I, I, I apologize. I thought these minutes were published and yeah. they're searchable, but if there are minutes that you're just holding on to, in your, in your book, then yeah, I I kind of take back the what I was sharing because I mean the, the the fact is I'm I'm I thought the intent was that these minutes are out in the public and people can search them and and get the information, but if they're not in that way, then there's, we we don't yeah. presently publish them that way, okay. and I, I don't if there were a need for it, I certainly would Got be it. willing to do it, but there's there's really really. I hadn't really thought about it. Anybody ever asked me to see them? No, yeah. we put them in a book. They go on a on, on a yeah. uh, on a bookshelf in my office, and that's that's essentially what happens with them. When you have a sleepless night, you pull them out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. it is actually kind of it, it, it's it's been entertaining for me from time to time when I've looked at some of the things from the Board of Health to go back and look at what the Board of Health did back in 1972, but th that's... <laughs> so, so my only comment on this is, you know, minutes for years have been pretty much open to the interpretation of those who wrote those minutes. Yeah. And I love it when we go to organizations and they say, are there any uh, corrections to the minutes? Well, the corrections are always as a result of the, 
of the person that didn't write it word for word. That's what the correction to the minutes are. So now that we have video archives and everybody can go to 1-0102 minute of the right. session, you have eliminated a person sitting somewhere and, in, and interpreting what they thought they heard us say. They're going to actually hear what we said and see what we said. So this to me is a no-brainer. Um, and for those that think, well, you got to have those and you know, you got to look, it, again, it was always open to the interpretation of the person that was sitting there writing the minutes. They could have gotten a word wrong. You won't get a word wrong when you watch the minutes. Right. You just won't. So I think it's, you know, I, this has been discussed at the, at, the, at the state level, at the Maryland Association of Counties. And uh, it certainly is not in violation of any open meetings. As a matter of fact, it enhances the open meetings experience because it allows for those to see exactly what happened, not what somebody thought they heard. Commissioner, I think you made a very good point. So, so that's where I am with this. I think it's, you know, that that sit, that having someone sit at a desk and take minutes, as that ship has sailed. So, that's my one and a half cents. I think you should make a motion. Okay. I move that the Carroll County Board of Health use video archives as the official record of the Board of Health proceedings in lieu of written minutes. Sure. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Lee, I've got different folks for these different uh, subject uh, areas, and, and I'll, uh, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to Lee and let, let him tell you what we, where we were and where we are now and where we're headed with the open burning program. We've been trying to uh, address some of the concerns that you had. I don't know if we're going to fully get to where we were before, but anyway, Lee. Thanks. Good, good morning, Commissioners. Um, yeah, Ed asked me that to speak about the open burning permit program that we're trying to get re-implemented. Um, as you might know, we had, we had an open burning permit program prior to 2012. In 2012, there were some signif significant budget cuts. And we lost over a quarter of our field staff and over half of our clerical staff. And in, the, in all that, we had to give up some programs. One of those was the open burning program. Um, at that point, we started referring people to MDE. And over time, we learned that MDE said, we don't have the resources to deal with this either. And so there have been no open burning permits in Carroll County since 2012. Um, so we, we've been discussing this um, in the last, I'd say, six months or so. And based on some technolog technological changes, I think we can more easily handle the burning permit part of this. Because with GIS, a lot of these things, we used to have to do site visits to every site and look at it. You'd, you'd meet with people at the counter that wanted an open burning program permit and tell them, um, okay, are you five football fields from any nearest occupied dwelling? And they'd say, sure. You'd go out there and you'd look 200 feet over to your right and there's a building, a house there. And so you'd say, unfortunately, you don't qualify. And so um, nowadays we can look at our GIS and handle that step. And so um, if somebody is qualified, we'll still do a site visit, make sure the materials they're burning are appropriate. And if they are, we'll issue the burning permit pro for them. Um, so anyway, so we're going to be have we met with law enforcement um, this spring. I'm going to be meeting at the next meeting with the fire chiefs to talk about how this might be implemented. The the big the big um, tough part is going to be the the whole complaint part of this, and we really don't have enough staff to be running out on all these. But we're we're glad to be a resource to them. We want to brainstorm with them as to how that could be done, because um, there's a lot of things that. There's some basically like a decision matrix we can go over with them and you know if this then that and so on and we can be accessible by phone, but we might not. And and to be honest, a lot of these things, I look back at what we used to do and in terms of uh, my employees' security, I kind of wish we hadn't been doing it. Like people going out at midnight to uh, back some farm lane in Tawny Town to tell them put out a fire. Right. Like that's not something I want my staff doing anyway. Well, you, you know how I feel about this because we've had many discussions over the last many years about this. Being a former fire chief, uh, I can tell you that it's always been a challenge. Mm -hmm. So my point to all that would be, if you don't have a permit, the fire gets put out, yeah. period. Yep. That fixes that if yep. there's a way in which to get a permit. See, that's yeah, the yeah, problem. Yeah. That's where we are. Right. So now anybody can do whatever they want. Um, and in, I will say that there are those citizens out there that do take uh, the, the extra step of calling the local fire department saying, hey, I'm going to light 
whatever mm-hmm. off uh, on Saturday. If you guys want to bring the hot dogs, come out. Um, <laughs> but there are those that don't. But I think it should be as simple as if we do have a permit procedure in place now, yeah. if you don't have a permit, it's very simple for our fire departments. Yeah. Water on the red stuff. Yeah. There's, there's two things I told Lee I, I wanted to accomplish. And, 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 you know, obviously asking for additional staff wasn't where I wanted to go with this. And I said, how can we make this work where we can meet the needs of what the, what the county's been asking us for without having to ask for additional staff and, and, and not overburden the staff that you have? And, and the two things that I want to be able to accomplish are essentially, like you said, be able to issue permits for people who could qualify for a permit because there's no way for anybody to burn legally right now in Carroll County. And, and the other thing is, is to be able to, in those cases where we have egregious violations right now, MDE is not willing to do anything about that. And, and you know, we, we, we get people who are repeatedly lighting things off, you know, five, six, seven times a month, and, and it's, it's causing problems in the neighborhoods. And this will give us some ability to, to interface with MDE and potentially if we have to in those egregious situations take some type of enforcement action mm-hmm. so that we can essentially right now you, you know people are just out of luck if, if if they've got a neighbor that's that's uh just a bad actor so w- i wanted to be able to help address that as well yeah that's an important part of it it's i would also to- ask that you put a uh, get a communication with the state fire marshal's office as well to make sure you get their take on because you know with when we got to the point where we all else failed we typically relied on them to come out um, but let's add them to the mix of the conversation. So absolutely, you were asking mm-hmm. about the price, Dick. What's the price of a permit? No, no, no price. Terms. We're going to make. We're going to. We're going to make this work. <laughs> That's okay. Essentially, what it boils down to. Yeah, we never charged before. Oh, you talk about for the, for the permit? Yeah. Yeah. No, no charge for the never. permit. I mean, we we could look at that at some point in time. I, I just we we never charged for the permits because it was my opinion at the time that all that would do is discourage people from getting a permit. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it does have some impact on us from a fiscal standpoint where we're going to have staff members doing this and whatnot. But I just I think it's counterproductive to, to charge a permit for fee for something like this, because I, I think all that's going to do is dissuade people from uh, from getting the permit and having us take a look at it. I believe Frederick County and other counties do charge fees. But I think the problem I see with it is that what we found in the past was like I'm going to say 70% of these or so don't meet the distance qualifications. And I think it would just create more paperwork with people saying, well, then I want a refund on my fee. It just would create more right. work than you're getting money for. Are there guidelines somewhere for our constituents to go find? Because I yeah, know yeah. people burn barrels in their backyard. Is that legal? That's or not legal. No, that's not legal. legal. That, I'm educated myself on that. So, so, so it's in the Code of Maryland regulations <laughs> under uh, air, air quality. I don't. I don't have I, I've done an abbreviated form of those that kind of focuses and puts some bold print on the things that relative to um, Carroll County. And so when we get this going, we'll have a page on our website where people can pull that up as a PDF, print it, and look at it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty concise when you kind of, if you look at the whole set of regulations, only two or three pages, but it's tough to pick out what's relevant to Carroll County because you have different air quality areas in the state and different rules for the different areas and so i've tried to set up something that somebody could easily look at and um and see what's so there's just right. a natural sense of ignorance that people just don't know mm-hmm. i've put quite a few of those out over the years <laughs> gotten yelled at a couple times yeah. too so. and on a dry yeah. summer mm-hmm. day they can be quite dangerous yeah. Yeah. So, well with the burn ban some of that yeah. is addressed yeah. there won't be any open burning yeah. permits yeah. during the burn ban yeah. okay so yeah, yeah. Don't, that, don't touch your old she shed Okay. okay. Uh, more to come on that. What's your timeline here? What are you talking about? Uh, we're supposed to meet, I think it's either next week or the week after with the fire chiefs. Okay. You know, so I should know something back. after. The goal is to have something in place when the burn ban ends. Which is September. Which is the end of August, I think. First, I believe. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, okay. Commissioner. Yep. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Sue, Sue, I don't know if you're bringing anybody else with you to talk about this. This is... Uh, Sue yeah, always says we, not we just both you. took leave of our senses in doing. Oh, in doing yes uh, She's coming up for the next one. Oh, okay. <laughs> she doesn't even know. And, and, and uh, Don't Sue throw came us to off. me. Uh, the the OOCC had some money at the end of the fiscal year, and they were asking for projects. And Sue came to me, and she said, "Well, you know, we're having a problem reaching some of the remote parts of uh, Carroll County with some of the services that we would need as a health department as a whole, not only from a 
from a substance use uh, treatment standpoint, but from, from all the services that we provide. And uh, she said, well, what, do you, what would you think about getting a mobile vehicle that we could get our services out into Tawny Town or Mount Area or other places where they're needed? Um, and and I, I said, so how are we gonna staff that? <laughs> and uh, so it, my, my initial thought was, I'm not sure about we wanna proceed with this, but as I got to talking to staff and, and talking about reaching some of these areas that are, that are really not served by all the services that we have here in Westminster, uh, I said, okay, well, I'm okay with this concept. And we just wanna talk to you a little bit about it. And, and I guess my thought on this is as I, uh, while, while we asked for funding through the OOCC for, for, the, uh, for the opioid related funds, I don't want this just to be the, the drug, drug treatment van. I wanna, if we're gonna roll this out into the community, I want people, you know, we're going through this whole thing with the real ID thing right now and people have to get birth certificates. I'd like to be able to put a staff member on there who could potentially say, hey, we're gonna have birth certificates available, you know, at the, at the library, up, up in the library parking lot in Pawnee Town on, uh, and it, we haven't talked about where we're actually gonna put these yet, but you know, something like that up in the Tawny Town Library parking lot. If you, if, you, if you can come to the mobile vehicle, you'll be able to get your birth certificate there on a certain day or, or uh, you know, other clinical services that we, we provide. Um, we do a lot of uh, work with HIV and hepatitis and things like that, that type of outreach. I'm just well, here to smile at you. <laughs> so I just, I kind of want to give the introduction and then uh, go ahead, Sue. I'm sorry, I'm it's stealing okay. your thunder. Why don't, why don't you go ahead and tell them about no what we plan to long, do with Sue. this? I know that's not true. Uh, just smiling. It, well, I can sit here and just smile <laughs> for this one. Um, so basically the data that we use to procure the funds to get the vehicle were the overdose data and the hotspots in the county. So the hotspots in the county are clearly Westminster, but there's a variety of services kind of clustered in Westminster that people can reach. But we also have um, a cluster of overdoses that are occurring in um, Manchester, Hampstead. Um, Tawny Town, Mount Airy, and then Sykesville. So we use that data from the Sheriff's Office, the ge um, geomapping that they do where the overdoses are occurring. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at what the provider, um, what providers are where and where they are and how people can um, access them. So in Tawny Town, um, we have one faith-based provider with one clinician. So there's a lack of resources there. And in Hampstead and Manchester, we have one clinician, period. Um, and then in Mount Airy, we have no services that are on the Carroll County part of Mount Airy as far as behavioral health. So we use that to show that we have this need, and even though um, when providers come into Carroll County, we meet with them as the local behavioral health authority. Maryland is what's considered an any willing provider um, state. So if they meet the criteria and they want to move into Carroll County, even though I try to guide them to the areas where the resources are needed, I don't really have a say on where they open up and whether or not they open up. If they meet the criteria and they're able to get licensed, they can open up another program in Westminster, mm -hmm. um, which then adds to our transportation issues. So we were looking at this collectively to see if we could address some of the outlying issues with people accessing resources, and whether it's treatment services or telepsychiatry services, um, we can do telebuprenorphine over it, where we connect with a provider who's doing the buprenorphine services and the provider sees them, but then we also know that they're linked with a service. But as Ed said, we wanted to make sure that we were looking at total wellness, so we were thinking about hepatitis testing, HIV testing, um, sexually transmitted disease um, screenings, birth, um, birth control, oh my gosh, pregnancy testing, that is not what my paper said. <laughs> pregnancy testing, blood pressure checks, cholesterol, um, naloxone training, um, crisis services, we're, we're kind of got our mind wide open right now in what we're doing. Um, we do have access to some fentanyl test strips that we thought we would put on that vehicle, peer services, and medical assistance applications in addition to birth certificates. So we've been talking to the provider community because this is one of those places where we had an opportunity to apply to procure the vehicle, but we didn't have enough time. We had one week to put this together to figure out how we were going to wrap all the treatment services and all of the providing um, of those services and resources around it. We as the local behavioral health authority will not be providing any direct services. So Ed and I have made it clear that it will be coming out of a different department of the health department if the health department has any services on that or whether or not we partner with other community-based behavioral health providers. Um, at the same time that this happened, our buprenorphine expansion 
grant opportunity came due. So every year we have to apply for the money that we get for uninsured and underinsured individuals to try to get them medication assisted treatment. Um, at that time, I took the opportunity to request a full-time peer recovery support specialist who could drive this vehicle. Um, that did two things. Number one, it procured somebody who's going to be able to drive the vehicle and get it to where it needs to go. But it also gives me, if we decide to put services on there one day that are not behavioral health related, it gives us somebody that can do an intervention and do a linkage and wrap that person around to care if somebody shows up that needs that care because they're able to do those things. So we have a driver and we're in the process of working with your staff to procure a vehicle and we're looking at these services and um, how we can get them to the outlying areas of our, our program. And I've already had one church in Sykesville um, approach me and say that we're very interested in having us um, have the vehicle in their parking lot and allow us to use any resources at the church that we would need. When they heard about it so I really you know I really want this to be a uh, I, I, I don't want it to be the thing uh, um, I guess a situation where it's the vehicle that's looked at that it's only for the, the, the population that needs behavioral health services because uh, and one of the other things that Sue didn't mention that I had mentioned to my staff is we have folks that do the car safety seat certification yes. checks and whatnot we might roll that out with it um, I, I just I want it to be a positive impact in the community so that people are comfortable with it's okay because if, if it's just a behavioral health vehicle we may have difficulty finding places where people want to let us park it so I, I think it's very important that this be an overall wellness vehicle mm -hmm. and that we we bring the services to the health department to the communities where we're going to where we're going to roll this out so it's while while the behavioral health stuff is very important there are other services that we provide that are very important to people in the community as well I share your concern I think it's great. It's very good this point. is awesome. It is a wonderful idea. And, you know, you and I have talked about this when, you know, I ran the installation. You know, we focused on wellness and resiliency, and that's what this is. So you're right. It is not just resiliency. It's just not picking people up, but it's, you know, providing ways for people to make good decisions, whether it's baby, you know, the seats and stuff like that. So making this van into or this vehicle into a wellness and resiliency uh, mobile program for our community is just phenomenal. Uh, we had to name the project, so. and I had, like, yeah. as I said, I had a week's notice and a day to write it. Um, yeah. So it's the well, for the County first week, Ed said no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for the Carol, first week, Ed said no. Carroll County yep, Care Collaborative me. makes a lot of sense. So it's, you know, so. and that way it opens it up to other yeah. partners and partnerships, and we'll figure out how we need to do yeah. that through either <clears throat> interagency agreements to have yeah. other staff on there, but we have a driver, so I think that we can work those other things out. I think the marketing and public awareness is key to overcoming what Mr. Singer's point is. Mm -hmm. It's gonna. It's the the vehicle is actually gonna get wrapped, and uh, it's gonna have the public health mm -hmm. uh, logo on it, and, mm -hmm. and and that type of thing. So, um, I, I guess what what I would suggest to you all is, if you hear from your constituents once we get this up and operating, that you know they'd really like to see us do X out of there. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some things that we would probably will have not be able to provide, depending on on regulation and things of that nature. But there there are a lot of things that I think we could do do out of the out of the vehicle. Um, we'd be glad to hear any input that you hear from anybody. So um, that's kind of why I wanted to talk about where we're headed with this. And Curious, down in South Carolina, is it Wesley Freedom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Wesley Freedom is very aggressive, and Roberta, you know this as well, aggressive, very <laughs> proactive in wellness and resiliency programs. So I, I applaud the work they're doing along with the entire community, and this is just another, another tool in the toolbox to keeping Carroll County healthy. So I fine. noticed that on the marketing of some contr contract trucks are out there, they'll have like HVAC, plumbing, boiler, or boiler points of what they do. Will that be incorporated on any of the logo? Or? Um, the, we, the, the only vehicle we've looked at is the one that Caroline County did, and that was actually pr what was presented that gave me the idea, and then I took leave of my census and presented it to Ed. <laughs> Um, and basically, it just talks about wellness, and the only other thing on the vehicle, it says that there are no medications stored on this vehicle. I think I so think that there's no reason. To. And, and I think putting specific uh, services on the side of the vehicle might not be the best idea right. because sometimes I'm a little concerned. Sometimes the health department's doing X, and then we add a service and we delete okay. this service right. depending on what the community need is. So 
we'll, we'll, we'll advertise it on our right. social media and on our web page and things like that. I think we want some positive, positive uh, messaging. And I think we even talked about having a, a little bit of a competition to the mm -hmm. design what, what, what the thing would look like when we wrap it. But um, I, I just I think putting specific services okay. on the side of there might not be a good idea because we might decide we're not doing plumbing this week and we're only doing HVAC. <laughs> you guys so. are professionals. I was just wondering about the marketing, how it's all be I'm delivered. just trying to keep it very generic. Okay. And that way there's no um, so stigma great. attached to it. And there's no issues attached to us being associated. So you guys won't do plumbing? I'm not going to do plumbing. <laughs> I'm not going to do plumbing. Not today. And, and, okay. and I can only do plumbing if we're if we're gluing PVC because the co I can't sweat a copper joint to save my life. And I was in there's the engineers. And, and, and that's, uh, you know, it's just and not And I catch the house on fire while doing it. <laughs> All right. I think okay. it's a great idea. I think you've got that general consensus from us. And it also goes a long way in what Commissioner Frazier has brought up as far as challenges to the downtown Westminster area. This gets the outreach out of there. So That's what we're trying to do. I'm trying so, Don't want to speak for you, Dennis, but I, I could yeah. read your mind. So, <laughs> you know, um, it's part of our, yeah. our contract with the state is to try to get the services where the people are. Um, exactly. It's just the fact that I'm competing. Um, you know, can't be any willing provider and give somebody a license and let them come in and open up wherever they want and then tell me I need an agreement to cooperate and I'm supposed to be placing resources where they need to be. It doesn't work though way yep. so um, if okay. they change that we'll be glad to <laughs> put resources where they need and i keep trying to send resources up to tawny town and down to thank uh, you very much area. okay dr downs um i don't know that you all have met dr downs before but he's uh he's the director of he's our our director for our um dental clinic and we we primarily in uh in in the health department we see uh folks that are on uh, Medicaid uh, dental because there's not enough providers out there in the community that are willing to accept Medicaid uh, dental because there's not the, the reimbursement rates not high enough for right. for most dentists to run a practice that way so we primarily we see pregnant women and and, uh, and and children in our dental clinic at the health department access Carol sees a lot of the adult population um, but Dr. Downs is the head of our dental program. Uh, the, the other piece of this that a lot of people maybe aren't aware of is we try to, we try to look at the whole community from, from an oral health standpoint and, uh, and try to see what we can do to improve the, the overall oral health of the community. So um, Dr. Downs is here today to talk to you about our fluoride rents program and there's been some changes there and we've been talking with the school system and I just wanna let him update you on what's happening with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, this all started when the uh, cost of fluoride rents increased this year by 300% due to regulation changes, uh, mostly at the federal level. So you go to the research and see what would be as effective as a fluoride rents program. And it turns out continued education is arguably as effective as fluoride rents in helping to curb dental disease. So our thought is, and we, I, we've got, gotten together with uh, some folks at the board, is to provide educational materials to the schools and provide different implements age appropriate. For example, K and pre-K, you give them a kitty toothbrush. Uh, grades one through five, our idea is to give them a youth toothbrush with uh, uh, some flossing paraphernalia uh, and reinforce it each year pre-K through grade five. And the instructional models, they, there's one with braces, so they learn if they get braces, how to clean around braces, which is always a problem. Uh, regular brushing and flossing. Uh, and, and they already have lesson plans in dental education. And I think if we could help them emphasize that on an ongoing basis, it would be at least as effective as a fluoride rinse program. So essentially what we're, we're looking at in, 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 in talking to the school system is uh, you know, we were one of the first, uh, we were the first uh, county in the state of Maryland to have a, a fluoride rinse program in our schools. And, um, you know, that I, fluoride, fluoride and fluoridation is, is, is an important, important thing because it's yeah. been one of the biggest advances in preventing cavities. In, in, uh, it's still the number one way to prevent tooth decay is use fluoride toothpaste and have uh, an optimally fluorinated water system. Mm -hmm. which is hit or miss in the county here. And, and you get rural, you have wells, and every well is different. Some wells have ideal amounts of fluoride. Most wells around here have none. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think the state of Maryland by population is over 90% of the population has uh, fluoridated water. 
So um, the, the, I guess the, the effectiveness of uh, quite, you know, I, I guess we, we feel like we can have just as effective a program working with the school system and this education and outreach the way that we would do it with these, with these models and, and uh, some of the things that we can hand out to the kids as we would with the fluoridation program. And we just, we don't, we don't have the money to pay for a 300% increase in the cost of, uh, of the fluoride rent. So that's where we are. We just wanted to let you all know about it. I don't really need any action on your part, but wanted to see if you had any questions. The cost would be comparable or less than the fluoride rinse program, to be perfectly frank. What exactly is the fluoride rinse program? What, what's the program? What, how is it instituted? Well, yeah. you can go ahead. Uh, what we've done in years past, and, and Carroll County's been doing it, uh, well, going through the uh, files forever and the day, it seems like, <laughs> it, which is good. It's a cup of fluoride, a disposable cup, concentrated fluoride. And what they do, one day a week, uh, the kids will, of course, you send a, a letter home for permission to participate in the program. They'll take the fluoride. The idea is to put it in their mouth, swish it for 30 seconds, spit put a uh, paper towel in the cup and dispose of it. This is done in the schools. It's done in, so in the school. It's a program classroom. through the schools. They get parent authorization to do it. Correct. Right. Okay. We've been partnering with the schools on this for, I don't know, I think it's probably 25 or 30 years close to. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time. It got implemented uh, very early in my career at the health department. I was looking it. through the records. I quit looking at uh, 2000. You know, it, I thought maybe you had to do a floor riding the water in each school. No, it's no. it's this is this is a a, a voluntary An actual direct thing. Right, right. Okay. And, so and you know it's 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 difficult in Carroll County. One of the things we've had discussions about. I mean, the the fluoridation of the water systems is important, but it's it's a little bit difficult here in Carroll County because a lot of our public water systems, and I know this from my environmental health days, they treat their water at each one of the wellheads. And if you have a centralized water system where you're adding everything at one place, that's easy. But if you have 12 different well heads where you're adding chemicals to the to, to the wells before you pump it out into your system it makes it much more difficult to add more treatment processes so you know I, I we, we had some discussion about whether we ought to be having a campaign to try to convince some of the municipalities to start fluoridating their water or not and, and I just think that uh, given the complexity of uh, having these uh, systems that are all well based and, and having multiple treatment systems on, on those it's, it, it might make things very complicated for the municipalities and the water water needs to be monitored I think the federal recommendation is daily uh, so not only do you have to each wellhead have to treat you have to monitor it and I could see in a small community that might be rather onerous expense yeah it's interesting they put the fluoride up 300 percent then want you to do all the rest of that stuff gotta love the feds okay yeah. anything else on that nope all right Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Good job. My pleasure. So who do we have to price both, both of you? Pat is coming back up. I'm going to handle some of it. And I've got too many <laughs> grants going on to handle all of it. I'm sorry. We missed you. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I, I will not be back for the next one. So, so just this one. <laughs> the only thing I'll say about crisis services is we've come a heck of a long way from where we were, what, two, three years ago where we had where Sue kept telling the state we've got zero crisis services and we need to do like something about this. And um, we've gotten quite a number of grants and we've expanded a lot of things that we're doing with, uh, with crisis services. So I just want to give you an update where we are on some of those services and some of the things we've accomplished today. So I'll give you the background really quickly. Back in 2012, when we became an integrated local behavioral health authority, um, we were the first in the state to inter no, the second in the state to integrate, excuse me. We had one of our um, behavioral health director meetings hijacked by the legislators, and they asked us to put together a crisis plan for the state and what each county had and what was missing. So there were three jurisdictions. We were one of them. We had zero. We had nothing for crisis. Everything we had, the only thing we had was the state's crisis hotline mm -hmm. that we were able to use. Um, so I've been fighting since then number one that if there was expansion of crisis services that the three jurisdictions that had nothing got a baseline and were brought up to a baseline before everybody else got more money um, what happened out of that whole thing was we created a document that said what was needed and it had like a 34 million dollar price tag on it and we were told thanks but no thanks yes we see the need for it and we'll work towards it and what we got was um, 56,000 some odd dollars for crisis response services and 52,000 some odd dollars for crisis intervention teams mm -hmm. 
they name things the same thing and I get confused. Um, so we did that for about two or three years and we had an urgent care um, clinician that worked for us and the law enforcement was trained in CIT and they would do behavioral health referrals and make referrals to us and it wasn't a very efficient use of our money. So about two years ago, three years ago, we asked the state if we could take that money and use it in a different way. So they came out, they met with us. We wanted to do mobile crisis services. We want we needed matching funds. So I asked the state if I could have $100,000 of that money to match against whatever grant I could find to do mobile crisis services. And then use the other 10, it's roughly $10,000 that's left over to continue to train the officers in crisis intervention teams um, and, and give them those skills that they need to help de-escalate situations and, and work together with them. So they approved that. We were able to get funding um, in the midst of all of that, creating an RFP to do one eight-hour shift in mobile crisis. We um, got awarded the OOCC money. We were able to do 16 hours in mobile crisis. So that was our first big crisis service we were able to put together. You all funded um, an op center. So we have a, a, a hot, a warm line, I guess it's called, because it's not 24 hours a day. It's 16 hours a day where somebody's answering phones. And, and that has been very instrumental mm -hmm. in helping um, mobile crisis get out to the scenes of where they need to be instead of um, following up with people or continuing. In addition to that, um, <laughs> Um, I actually told the state no, I wasn't interested in money, and they said, great, you're in. Um, mm -hmm. So we were awarded $1.8 million to do some crisis expansion. Um, that includes 10 triage beds that are going to be at the RSS location that went out in the new RFP. And it also includes a walk-in crisis center seven days a week. Access Carol was selected to do that because they were open seven days a week. They received funding um, for four slots, walk-in crisis slots every day. Um, and in it added into that grant was some expansion for mobile crisis. That expansion will include um, mobile crisis um, law enforcement yeah, team up. So whether um, we have interest from the sheriff's office and interest from Westminster City Police. So we'll be wa wa working with both of them to see how we're going to move forward with pairing up a social worker with a police officer and we're looking at the night shift because that's what's not covered by mobile crisis mm -hmm. so we're going to we really when we're doing this we're trying to really be respectful and look at our data and see where the services are needed so our original intent was to do mobile crisis in the evenings um however when we got the expansion money we were like oh we're going to do the evenings and night shift well then when we looked at the data the need was really during the day and in the evenings the the, the hospital was able to cover what was happening overnight and law enforcement's data reinforced that to us, that there were less less things happening overnight than there were during the day or in the evening. So some of the things are contrary to what we believed, um, and part of it was getting people to straighten out their data uh, before, so we could look at it, because at first, when we went to ask the hospital about their overdose data, we got this much of what their overdoses really were, because when people come in, they come in as a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest or an unconscious victim. So that's what the diagnosis and the code was on the record. So um, we had to do some back digging and get them to put a place in there to say if it was related to any kind of substance whatsoever, that there's a check mark that goes in a box and that, that data now gets flagged so that we can have a more comprehensive look at what's going on in the system. Um, further, <laughs> do you want to talk about the other grants we applied for? Because, I mean, I can. Um, we have been approved um, to replace our urgent care because we had lost some funding and then we did another application for another grant to replace our urgent care person to work with those behavioral health referrals that we get from our CIT officers. Um, as they said, the referrals over to Veronica Dietz, our crisis director, and then she screens through them to see what services people, individuals need. We make phone, follow up phone calls back to them. So we now have, a, have been approved for a 40 hour person to replace our original um, person that we lost and then we've also made application with Westminster City for a lead diversion um, opportunity which is law enforcement diversion which hopefully at arrest or at the incident the officers would have the opportunity to determine whether or not this needs to be an arrest or diversion to treatment um, working with mobile crisis and other you know our triage beds and other things so that hasn't been approved yet but it will be forthcoming and we'll probably be back before you with um, if that gets approved with the chief of Westminster City 
And we're also talking at, right now at this point about EMS CIT. Um, so we have our CIT law enforcement officers, but we've, you know, started there and now we are in um, conversations with working with certain departments to have CIT officer, well, EMS providers on the scenes as well. Because oftentimes they're the first responder before a law enforcement agent ever gets there. So, um, you know, especially with our overdoses and things like that, and there's still a, um, a real lack of education on behavioral health services in the EMS world. Um, what diagnoses look like and how to respond to those diagnoses. So we want to beef up some of our education to those providers. So. We had interest from two departments directly yeah. asking for training of their um, EMS staff and their first responders. So we're, we're mildly excited mm -hmm. about, you know, expanding that and getting that training out there. So there's a lot going, a lot of moving parts there, and uh, yeah. a lot of it makes us uncomfortable, and we always wonder how it's going to work. But so far, it works out. Things that things have been uh, moving forward very very well. So. Okay. All right. Nice. All right. Um, I, I'm not going. I, I had a, a a PowerPoint and and some of the data. Um, Amy, you want to come up? Um, some of the data that's on here, we we kind of questioned some of it. We 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 it's it's related to suicide at, attempts and and uh, com completed suicides and suicide attempts. I don't feel like I, I don't want to keep you guys into your lunch and I don't feel like I need to necessarily go through the PowerPoint slides because all I want to leave you with is we over the last five years we've seen a, a, a 56 percent increase in uh, in, in suicides uh, among uh, youth um, we've we've also a couple of other data points that I thought were interesting the majority of the, the folks that have Committed suicide that are in the age group from 10 to 17 are, are white, non-Hispanic males. The interesting flip point to that is um, the folks who have uh, who have been most uh, had, we've had the most non non-fatal uh, near-death um, suicide. I guess suicide attempts is the best way to put it. Ha have been actually females, uh, non. Hispanic white females. So it's, uh, I guess the males are more successful, uh, if you want to call it successful, in completing suicides, but the, the uh, attempts are much higher on the female rates. Yeah. Um, I just, I guess what I wanted to do was tell you a little bit about what we're doing about this. It's a concern, regardless of how you want to argue about what the data is or whether it's skewed because we have more services here and we identify it more readily in Carroll County. Carroll County, as I've showed you before, is at the top of the charts on on uh, near suicide, uh, you, you know, near 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 completed suicides, where, where people have attempted suicide and and uh, and and and, and be, been near death, but it may be because we're identifying it better here. But I want Amy to talk to you a little bit about what we're planning to do to, to try to address this problem. Uh, thank you, Ed. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief, but because we have identified such high rates of suicide attempts and completions in Carroll County. Um, one of our staff, Adrian Sanders, has pulled together a suicide prevention coalition, which started in April of 2019. Um, it's a collaborative effort with um, many players in the community. So we have the Sheriff's Department, Corrections, Westminster Police Department, the hospital, uh, behavioral health providers, the school system, a representative from MDH, um, suicide survivors, bereaved individuals, uh, all attending and as well as members from the American um, Foundation for Suicide Prevention sitting on the coalition. What we've done is we've identified um, primary target areas for work groups um, and what they are is to develop um, within our current fatality review boards reviewing suicides, uh, completed suicides to determine who kind of, what was happening? Were these people in treatment? Did they have access to treatment? What could we do better to um, kind of in that prevention arena? But what we're really talking about all through the continuum is prevention, intervention, and postvention um, for people who are either suicidal, they have the thinking, they have the attempts, um, or they have family members who have completed suicide because we know that the rate increases if you have a loved one who has completed suicide, your risk increases. Um, so we also have developed work groups to look at access to treatment for people leaving the emergency department or primary care doctors uh, or even inpatient units. 
um, also for increasing support groups. So out of this has already come two new support groups in the, in the community. Um, one's going to be at the Youth Service Bureau for adolescents who are bereaved, and one's going to be at, on our own Peer Wellness and Recovery Center for individuals with, um, who are actively suicidal. Um, and we're doing that in conjunction with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Uh, in addition, we're going to be working on um, increasing awareness, reducing stigma, increasing training, and developing a campaign um, and a toolkit so that when we're encountering people wherever, uh, whomever's encountering them, they know where to send them, what the resources are, what the support groups are, uh, et cetera. Um, and we're also going to be looking for a proclamation for Suicide Awareness Month in September. Um, and we are really promoting all of the upcoming suicide awareness events, um, uh, such as the Out of Darkness Walk. So we're talking about, you know, people developing teams to walk because the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention gets monies that they reinfuse back into our county. Um, and then, you know, sending people to trainings and developing further trainings, not just for behavioral health providers, but for consumers. We're hoping to get primary care providers involved in this because um, they may be the first line of fire. They may see people in their offices first who say, hey, I've been thinking about I want to kill myself. Um, and the primary cares aren't trained to deal with that. Um, and we're doing this all without any funding. So the AFSP, American Foundation, does infuse some services and resources back into the community, but we're developing all of this without any additional funding. So I think that's important to note. Um, another thing that's come out of the, the coalition is to develop um, a, a screening and brief intervention for teens in the hospital or maybe in primary care situations, so really screening for suicide. The school system is very big on screenings and have made, uh, in the 2017-18 school year, there were 1,024 interventions for students who were either suicidal or self-injuring. Um, and that's been a notable increase since 2010-2011 school year, probably like four times. So, um, and then we're also looking at what are brief, very brief trainings that we can go around and uh, present to all kinds of different um, intervening bodies. So whoever would want that. Has there training. been any analysis or trending shown in the senior citizen suicide rates? Uh, I mean, uh, go ahead. We do, I mean, we have the statistics. The thing about suicides is they're a little bit hard to look at the statistics and really glean what you need to glean because people come into an ER with attempts and they mask it as something else. Um, so the attempts are a little bit harder to discern, although we have data from the hospital. Um, and then from the OCME, we get data and sometimes they are um, labeled it overdoses, but they were really suicides. So we're having a little bit of trouble discerning that. We know overall that seniors do, can tend to have a high uh, rate of suicide or a higher rate of suicide, but I don't think that we have the hard statistics today to tell you, but we can get that. All right. I'd be interested in considering our senior populations all balloon soon. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that will impact mm -hmm. this, this issue here we're faced Absolutely. with and how we can be proactive in that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think the proactive piece of that is the thing, all the things that Amy mentioned that we're doing with this coalition that we've brought together. It's much like what we're doing with the opioid prevention coalition in, in uh, trying to pull the key members of the community together to try to deal with this with this issue and bring resources to the people who need them. Appreciate it. Okay. So you can just sit here, Amy, because the last piece is just a real quick. I, I just want to <laughs> let you guys know about the. Uh, a change in our, our HIV uh, services at the health department. We've, for a number of years, we've had a, uh, an HIV clinic at the health department that's uh, been run through cooperation with Johns Hopkins. And our, our population of people who, who need to be clinically managed has, 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 we have about 30 folks in Carroll County that, that are uh, actively uh, being treated for HIV that, that come to our clinic. And it's a once a year type of thing. So really the need for the clinic has, has, has dwindled and uh, Hopkins uh, really, uh, they, they were gonna tell us that they wanted to stop coming to Carroll County anyway because there's not a need. So we're, we're changing the way our program works and essentially from providing clinical services, but we're, we're 
replacing that with, we've asked the state for some additional funding through what they call Ryan White B to offer increased outreach and education screening and, and referral to services for people who are identified that, that, that need these services. Um, and to offer uh, that, those linkages to, uh, to treatment services. The, um, the clinic's still gonna operate in Ricerstown, which is not in Carroll County, but it's not very far away. It's just, we don't have, uh, we don't have a large enough population of people with HIV at this point to justify uh, running a clinic here at the, at the, at the health department. So we're gonna, we're gonna provide more support services, more outreach, education, testing, that type of thing. Um, we, we, we need to be careful though because you know it could balloon at, at any point in time it's not to say that we couldn't apply and bring those services back at some point in time it's just right now it's not practical for us to be running an HIV clinic at the health department um, it's it's putting a lot of money into something that there's there, there, there are not a lot of clients for um, so we're, we're gonna make sure that people have services we're, we're gonna continue to link people with the appropriate services but that, that's changing a little bit the way things look presently at, at the health department. Mm -hmm. So do you all have any questions about that? Again, the, the important thing is, is, you know, if you get one person who's infected that winds up with uh, sharing needles or something in your, in your IV drug use population or, or ha having unprotected sex in, 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 in exchange for drugs or things of that nature, you could easily have this balloon and we'll be prepared to deal with that if we were to have that type of in issue happen but we're, we're trying to prevent these things and and a lot of the initiatives we have uh are, are about outreach and education and prevention and and uh but we we do need to be prepared in case we were to have something that were to cause us to have a blip but right now the need's not there okay so Any if questions? uh you have no questions i'm ready for you all to uh De deconvene yes. or whatever is a, as a board of health and uh are you buying us lunch <laughs> yeah, are you? all right thank thank you all very much uh, i'll entertain a motion to adjourn as the board of health and reconvene as the board of county commissioners so moved second all in favor aye, aye. Thank you. okay Good now job, you Ed. reach down thank and get you your other hats on thank you all very much we appreciate it okay uh that brings us to just about the end here um we have a couple things for uh, public comments. No, don't have any. Uh, administration, uh, administrative, um, open anything admin. for open admin. So I do. Um, okay. Um, several weeks ago, um, the, uh, the you guys um, awarded a contract for after-school services, um, and um, and the. The discussion went between three days a week and versus two days a week, and you came down on the on the end of three days a week, and um, we being asked if we could start the pilot program actually as two days a week. The, um, they feel it will be more successful as a two day a week program, um, at least for the first year, and then reevaluate to see whether um, whether the you know the expand is two day or whether you expand. Um, as, as a three-day. So if um, we talked with purchasing, you don't need to do anything other than just have a motion to um, change it from, from a uh, three-day three -day program to a two-day program. And I appreciate the reach back by uh, YSB. Uh, well, no, 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 Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Girls Club. Right. Uh, you know, to be, to be honest about the fact that uh, yeah. you know, they just They're don't have the resources to do it right now. So which is, yeah. well, I'm, I'm, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it at that. So anyway, uh, is there a motion to that effect? And I, I think I made the other point pushing for the three days a week at that time for the effectiveness mm -hmm. of it, but if they can't handle, right. don't have the resources to handle it, I move that we go to two days a week. I'll second that. Okay, and again, it's a pilot program, so hopefully after that first uh, yeah. year, we can get to that three. That's the, you know, I, I, I so. agree. I, I do okay. appreciate their honesty. Right. Not trying to do something they can't, not equipped to do yet. Correct. So. Right. Do it well rather than. Right. Our heart's in the right place, yeah. I believe. All right. Yeah. Any other comments on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, really quickly before we get to agenda, I've just got a couple quick things I, my colleagues need to know from MAKO. Um, there's um, there's uh, some open meetings. 
um, items that are going to come up as a result of a recent uh, ruling, uh, specifically in Talbot County, uh, where it has been determined that uh, things done electronically are now uh, susceptible to uh, open meetings. So um, insert reply all here is kind of the message that we got because when you're when you're when you're doing that, um, it it can be a violation of the Open Meeting uh, Act. And where this would come into play for us, and uh, you know, I always preach about how transparent we are, and we are. We don't do anything behind the scenes, but there are times that we need last minute decisions, especially during the legislative session, where Mike is looking for for for. Uh, some sort of direction down in Annapolis and we'll we'll get on the phone and I'll talk to each of you and I'll say hey what do you think and most of you will go yep good with that well good with that doesn't good with that so we're gonna get more on that Tim's yeah. aware of it Tim shared it with Roberta after yesterday's um, Mako session so just keeping you aware of that yeah we'll get um, we'll get you an updated briefing right yeah, that'll be very helpful for all of us to have and be informed so yep. we know where so we're we'll, at. we'll know what we can and can't do and Again, we pretty much know what that is, but we'll and I and I think we'll get more of that uh, in August uh, when we're at the at the conference as well. Uh, utility scale solar siting uh, is is a big issue right now. Uh, Ed, you heard that conversation mm -hmm. with me yesterday. Um, we want to get ahead so that I think right now PSA can tell us what we can do. Let's be clear, but they don't on where we can put these utility solar. Uh, uh, banks or whatever you want to call them. I'd rather, and I think, I hope all of you agree, I'd rather get ahead of it as a county and address it from a zoning standpoint so that we can allow these without being told where they can go. I don't like being told by the state or the PSA about what we can and can't PSC, do in care. Just. Yeah, the PSA, yeah, PSC. So anyway, um, I asked Tom uh, Devilbiss if he'd take that and go with it and bring a report back to us so that we can get ahead of it. Uh, we've never really addressed that before. So, Dennis, I know you're in agreement with that. I didn't talk to you about it, but I knew you would be. But we need to get a handle on where these sites can and can't go before we're told where they can and can't go. So Tom's going to be coming back with a, with a report on that. And lastly, uh, NextGen911, um, that certainly has moved on. We're going to hear more of that because we're going to have the ability to enhance the finances behind that. But one of the things that's come up is in places where your 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 911 centers are, if you don't do the entire 100% dispatching and call taking from that location, it could be a challenge. We and Carol don't because the Maryland State Police and the Tawnytown Police Department have their own dispatching. So um, we're going to look at that, and I've, Jack, I've already talked to Jack about that. We take the calls, but immediately transfer them. Yeah. So um, I think we might be okay there, but we're going to make sure that we are so that we can indeed get the, the, the finances that we need as a result of the legislative 911 actions that we're taking. So the devil's to, always in the details. Yep, more to come on that, so just letting you know that. Um, and there will be more to come. we got to... We, we got a little bit of a talk about climate change. That's always going to be interesting. Uh, that's going to come up. My point is the conference is going to really be good this year. There's a lot of things on our plates. So I want, um, if you guys don't have a, a copy of the, um, of the agenda, make sure you get it. I've got some, uh, and if Vivian's got some in the possible, office. Possible. I'd like for you to go over one of those agendas for me and print it out and highlight things that you think will be applicable. We got one for everybody, right, so good. we'll get make sure you get it. Um, so that's it for MACO. Um, we meet again at MACO. Uh, the, the legislative group uh, will be then again meeting in September as well. So a lot of things go on past that January March thing uh, where interesting decisions are made. We're trying to get a handle on that. Just so to add on to that, just a shout out to Mike. Fowler, yep. continually staying engaged down there. He uh, he was there yesterday participating with us, so I really appreciate his work yep. he's doing. And you know the other thing too, and I'm, we're, we're done here, but I, I want to make sure that you know that there's a lot of con there's a lot of uh, concern about the the atmosphere in Annapolis in the next three years, uh, yeah. and I think you've seen some of that because 
I'll give you the example of the BSO. You know, people are yelling at the governor to release the funds for the BSO. Right. Well, the governor's being very, very, uh, he's, frugal. He, he, he's frugal. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the state's going to experience almost a billion dollar uh, deficit here. Okay. So uh, I don't know where these folks think all this money's coming from, but, you know, um, taking it out of savings accounts doesn't help. So it's going to get interesting down there. We experienced the same thing. Yes, we did. Okay. So anyway, all right. Anything else for open admin agendas, real quick? Um, week of July the fifteenth, Monday the fifteenth is the Herbology Dispensary Grand Opening. <laughs> Commissioner Fraser will be in attendance there. That's out at the Corporate Center Court. Yeah. Don't eat the what cookies. Was the one you that was an open house. This is the actual ribbon cutting. Oh. This is where everybody comes through the door. I'm thinking, didn't they already do that? Yeah, 9 a.m. Yeah. is planning and zoning. Commissioner Rothstein on Tuesday the 16th. Also on Tuesday the 16th is walk with your commissioner. Uh, this is in District 3 with Commissioner Frazier at the Westminster Community Pond at 7 p.m. Tuesday the 16th. Wednesday the 17th, is it Lenar? Do Lenar. I have that right? Correct. Uh, that's a Warfield ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, long time coming there, Commissioner Rothstein, 11.30 a.m. on Wednesday the 17th. Thursday the 18th, open session. We'll get a re uh, annual report from the Department of Planning, uh, annual payment for computer data dispatch systems, jurisdictional family services grant, circuit court, uh, magistrate office, office child support grant award, sheriff's office grant award, community development block grant. A lot of grants coming in. That's good. Change roof replacement. Shelter system redesign, uh, senior assisted living group home, uh, grant submission, uh, request use for a term contract for the pipe video inspection services, hot, miss ax hot mix asphalt paving changes, storm drain rehab again, we had some of that today, stream channel improvements to deep run, uh, replacement generator for the Pleasant Valley wastewater treatment plant. And we're gonna buy some tractors, maybe and uh, bid approval for management software that's all open session which by the way please note begins at 9 a.m. on Thursday the 18th um, you know I, I'd like to entertain just food for thought we often go deep into our lunch break I don't know why we can't start these sessions at 9 a.m. instead of 10 I don't okay, know why guys. 10 has always been the magic number um, but just think about it, gentlemen. I'd like to entertain that perhaps we change it so we're not so rushed, especially when we've got something to do in the afternoon, uh, especially during July and August, just the food for thought. Uh, then you're going to have another, we might have another work uh, if we need it after the day of comprehensive rezoning at 1 p.m. on Thursday the 18th. Uh, reminder to the public that we decided uh, a couple months ago that every Friday in July we'll be closing early at 3 p.m. Uh, this first Friday coming up will tomorrow. be that tomorrow, and then every Friday in July, there's be two more after that. Uh, the <laughs> county offices will be closing at 3 p.m. See how that goes. Uh, Commissioner Boucher has the commissioner's report, and at 5 p.m. also on Sunday the 21st, there's a National Case Institute orientation dinner at Francis Scott Key High School. Uh, that's Commissioners Weaver and Boucher attending that. Anything else for the agenda on that week? Week of July 22nd. Monday the 22nd, Town Mall Grand Opening of various stores. That's mm -hmm. positive. 3.30 p.m. on Monday the 22nd. Tuesday the 23rd, walk with your commissioners. That's somebody doing something. On Wednesday, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh I'm sorry. I expect you to be there. <laughs> uh, that's the best one. That's uh, Commissioner <laughs> Weaver at Sandy Mount at 7 p.m. Tuesday the 23rd. Thursday. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Ooh. Walk with the walker. Oh, no, I don't know. Anyway, Thursday the 25th, uh, we have open session. Charter procedure overview is at 10 a.m. that day. Uh, Bear Branch Nature Center roof replacement. Uh, the county's official intent to reimburse expenditures from our comptroller. Uh, loan requests from the Hampstead Volunteer Fire Department. Health and dental insurance rates from HR. Homeless Round Family Support Center grant from the Citizen Services, Utility Relocation, BGE, uh, on that unnamed stream on Hollingsworth Road. We've mm -hmm. done something on an unnamed stream before. 
Uh, grant application and grant award for the Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant. That's our state's attorney. Uh, at 1 p.m., uh, we have, um, on the 25th, we have a public hearing on a purchasing bid pro protest uh, that we will be involved in. That's on the 25th. Uh, also that day at 4 p.m., Cup Cafe, Grand Reopening, Boucher and Frazier. 7 p.m. is Walk with Your Commissioner at Freedom Park. That's Commissioner Rothstein. Is that the track they shortened? Well, they had to. <laughs> on the 26th at 3 p.m., we will be closing again. Just a reminder, said it enough, and Commissioner Rothstein has the Commissioner's Report. Anything else on agenda? I have a question. When is I asked for an item to be put on there about uh, economic development incentives that I've talked about to be put on future agendas. When is that coming up? Oops. Soon. Really soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, yep. the, uh, the, the, uh, Got us yeah. the, um, the closing costs thing. Yeah. That. So, yes. I'm oh, sorry. That's my yes. fault. Forgive me. Okay. Anything else? Uh, if not, we are going to recess for about 30 minutes, unfortunately. Um, well, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, for our work session at 1 p.m. Uh, on our continuing adventure through comprehensive rezoning. What's this for? So I need a motion to recess until 1-ish. So made. Second. Did you get the ish part? I got it. If the, you need a little lunch, we'll be a little bit late, so 1-ish, we'll okay? 